Good evening, it's episode 40, ProSynth Network Live Show. Welcome, it's just gone 8pm here in the UK, uh, just gone 3 of course on the East Coast, midday or just gone on the West Coast and we're here back with another weekly show of music technology, banter and news stories and just general chit chat and I'm joined as always by my faithful partners Chris and Ben and we are delighted to welcome back this week, uh, was, was going to be last week but you know circumstances didn't allow that. But here we are with uh, Dominic Hawke and Chris Cynthia and Ben Simpson. Welcome, gentlemen. How are you all? Good, thank you. I've, yeah. I've, I've made it. Apologies for Yay. missing out last week. I, I do apologise. Uh, not at all. Not at all. Just glad that we could get you back. Yeah, thank um, you. We, we, thought, we thought it was something we said, maybe. <laughs> no, I wish it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true, true. Oh, dear. So, uh, Mr. Simpson, um, how are things in your world? Been very, very busy. At about yeah four hours sleep over the past like five doing days. doing anything Something. interesting or uh i'm just working on songs for the the album um, okay cool the electromantics thing so yeah and how, how is um national lockdown affecting you uh yeah well i've got the luxury of being able to work from home now mm -hmm. so I, i'm not doing any music during the day i'm just doing all the work i'm supposed to be doing which is <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You're, you're saying that on air, but yeah. Yeah, 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 but it's true. I've not done any music during the day. <laughs> no, so just no dear. Not good. Anyway, good to see you, mate. Chris, um, how are things over on the uh, west coast of uh, the US of A? I mean, obviously, it's it's been a turbulent time, shall we say, on in your <laughs> neck of the woods. How, how are you keeping? Yeah, we're doing all right here. Uh, I just good. try to keep it at home as much as I can and... Mm -hmm. Had some fun. Uh, spend so much time with synthesizers that uh, this week I just had to get back to guitar a little bit. So I've been listening to some of my favorites. I've got my, uh, let's see, which way do I go here? I've got my Jeff Beck Truth album up there. Mm -hmm. And I've been listening to some John Mayle and the Blues Breakers with Eric Clapton and some Cream. And so just having some fun time with cool. with guitar. And um, I know we, you know, we don't want to dwell on the uh, the pandemic, but I hear things are getting a little bit kind of crazy, particularly in California. You know, it's uh, your numbers are, are, are as, as rapidly increasing as ours. I hear. Mm. Yeah, uh, seems that way. And, and from what I hear, I haven't been keeping too much on top of the news lately. But I guess we're having some problems of getting the vaccine to where it should go. So yeah. hopefully, we'll get that stuff sorted out. Good. Glad to hear it. And let's go um, to Mr. Hawken. So, good to have you back, sir. How have you been since we last um, since well, we last spoke? Yeah, without dwelling on it, I, I had a migraine mm. about an hour before we were meant to be going live. And um, it was a proper full-on. I, I used to get them a lot as a kid. And there's nothing you can do. But it's proper full-on. It must be like a stroke. It's like you lose the feeling down half of your body. Wow. Your vision goes. And, and you get this sort of like someone's drilling through your eye. I used to get it a lot as a kid. I would always get it after exams so like when the stress was over suddenly yeah. which is so weird to even get it when we were about to do something because that would normally negate yeah. any migraines um and when i was about 14 or so they found uh these things called um triptans which are drugs that you can take as soon as you feel it coming on mm -hmm. and they kill it and they knock you out and they make you talk blurry and they kind of make you sleep <laughs> for 12 hours like you're drunk but it doesn't it destroys all the, the pain and the headaches so well, it all became manageable mm -hmm. um and then there's other drugs funnily enough they found a drug for um uh epileptics which they that stops epilepsy but actually it stops the occurrence of migraine so so mm. since the age of about 14 i've had very few and when i've had them i take one of these tablets lie down 
and uh, and it's been fine. This time I took the tablet, laid down fine, woke up in the morning and had another one, mm. and the tablet didn't work because when they when they actually kick off, it destroys your um, digestion. So unless you take the tablet quickly, you can't digest it. Right. And that was it. So day two was just like the mother mm. of all, like, oh, oh. I'm going to die, you know, no. what's going on. <laughs> And since then, I was like saying just before we came on air, so up until kind of yesterday, I've been like, I don't really quite know if I'm here or not. Let's just you know, take it easy. <laughs> so, yeah, thankfully, okay. hopefully we're, we're all back in, the, back in the room again now. And, uh, <laughs> well, I can I've try got and the, do all the things I was meant to do last week. Yeah, I've got the kill cam button. Should you just go yeah. like that? I'll just... <laughs> 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 anyway, um, good to have you, mate. Um, Thank you. And we'll, we'll talk more um, about certain things a little bit later. Let's say hello to everyone that's in the chat room. Uh, people have been in there for the last half an hour so we've got uh, get so many music which is brian we've got native vs wagyu um asio head all the the usuals jupiter boy 74 i saw simon in there earlier as well um emx gold who i think that's part of your band isn't it ben it is, yeah. It is. Well, he, he is part of your band, not that. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. that, that will do. That, that. Yeah. Uh, X101, <laughs> Martin Stonehouse. Oh, Martin Stonehouse is in the house. That didn't sound right, did it? Um, Martin, <laughs> Martin's the guy. Do you remember I um, spoke to you about the, the uh, data stream mini disc and the, the floppy disc album? Um, I, I, we spoke about it a few oh, weeks ago. He, he yeah. released this album yeah. on Bandcamp and then released all the tracks as general MIDI files on a three and a half inch floppy disk. <laughs> Great um, so you can then just, it's brilliant. His his material and his um, his manufacturing process is fantastic. Absolutely love it. Um, Sasquatch 100 Things I Do. That's 100 Things I Do is um, our friend, oh, I can't remember his yeah. name. It's gone completely off my um, Michael, isn't it? It's Michael. Um, so hello to you. And who else have we got in there? Ganaceta's in there. Atu Z, Corrosive Abuser, Mickey D and his famous shed, which I've just received a picture of. Um, <laughs> he's just built this shed in his backyard and kicked it out with all his gear. Graham's there, Edna's Disco Machine, and Inky's in there, Max there, Mike, Tra- Mike Hydra Pneumatic. Keithin, Keithin Watford. Oh, I like that. Keithin Watford. Very good. Uh, Wombra. Um, and yeah, do you know, I'm, I could say Steve Elbows. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's it's a pleasure um, to have you and hopefully um, we'll entertain you for the next couple of hours. Um, before we do that, let's just get all the, the formalities out of the way. So if you um, aren't already... Uh, please do join us on our Facebook page, the ProSynth Network. Just search for us on Facebook and you can take part in all the shenanigans that goes on there during the week. Um, if you wish to donate to us, and we are incredibly grateful when and when you do, there's the uh, the link. You'll also find it down below in the description uh, underneath this video if you're watching on YouTube. Um, and of course, uh, we have our regular PSM bingo card, which is supplied to us by Native VS. It's a brand new one this week. So if you want to play along during the show, see if we come up with some commonly used terms, have a bit of fun if we're boring you with our chat. Um, and coming up um, a little bit later on, we'll have the um, the, the weekly poll discussion, which is um, from a, a question that's been posted on the, the Facebook page. And we'll, we'll discuss that at greater length. Uh, back then so there you go that's all the formal stuff out of the way um let's crack on shall we let's do our first uh news topic um which is the fact that sequential have launched uh, a beta os that converts the flop to vintage or gives you the, the ability to have both i believe um so i'm going to hand this over oh, let's go to ben first on this one because I don't have either an OB6 or a Profit 6, um, so I couldn't tell you uh, how it works, if it works, if it's any good. Ben, over to you, sir. Mm, uh, well, I, I updated my and um, it, 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 it does have a great effect on the sound. It, it, it can go like really kind of like gnarly sounding, you know, if you have it too high up, it, it actually destroys destroys the sound really <laughs> so it's best just to use it in moderation but it really does add more character to it. i've got the profit six and mm-hmm. chris has got the ob6 and um i i think it's a huge improvement on the slot the slot thing it also adds some mpe stuff as well but I 
Yeah, I noticed that in the description is that, that it provides yeah. MPE support. So yeah, I I don't know what that actually involves. I don't <coughs> know if the others have got more information on that. But yeah, the the vintage the vintage knob is is far better than the the slot knob. <laughs> and and <laughs> <Yeah. sw> <laughs> that's a horrible <laughs> name, isn't it? So. Uh, switching between swap and vintage how is that done is that a, a, an easy thing to do yeah, can you yeah, combine it's, them it, it, yeah it's just uh it it's in the the same menu system as everything else is done, right you know, with the global button and gotcha and some thingy but i don't i don't think i'll go back i don't know really can you can you them. combine slop with vintage or is it one or t'other no i think it's one or the oh. other okay yeah, yeah. okay but it, yeah oh. it's a edition mm. brilliant you know, good excellent so really that's the profit one. six how about the OB6, Chris? How is that? Uh... <laughs> yeah, so I got right on it and was going to do a video on it and uh, see what it does and was really excited about it. This is something that uh, we've talked about uh, because Sequential has been dropping hints that this would be the next project they do. And I believe it's uh, Chris over at Sequential that has been working on it. And so it's like within minutes of it coming out, I saw it and I... I spent the next half of the day trying to get it onto my OB6 and uh, kind of going mad using the same system you have here because you have to do it over SysX. Same system that I've upgraded it before and kept having problems. And uh, one of the guys at Sequential popped on the boards and said, hey, try the bootloader. And so I went through and did that. And every sort of adjustment you can make in SysX, I did. And different uh, interfaces and you know, USB, MIDI DIN, like trying to make it work, and I've never gotten to work. So uh, my buddy, who's Prophet 6 that I uh, created a sound bank for, uh, brought his over, and I wanted to check the sound set that I had made on it just to make sure that it was compatible. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was able to update that right away. So I think, and then since that time, you know, last few days, I've seen a lot of ob6 keyboard version users that are not able to upgrade a few have been able to and it looks like the uh, desktop version that's working so uh, unfortunately yeah, I, I haven't heard it on my own name ob6 but on the mm. profit it was it was quite interesting and again it's it's where a slot just affected um, tuning variation uh, on the oscillators this also does it for uh, the filter and for envelopes as well and it's a little, at first, it's a little bit on the subtle side, but it has a, a really beautiful sound. And if you keep it, you know, uh, at moderate settings, like a, especially if you're playing like an arpeggiator from, you know, using the arpeggiator and you start moving that, that vintage up on there, it can create some really nice mm. lush movement. So it's a really cool thing that they're doing. I'm really glad yeah. that they're doing. And I imagine um, they'll get that those problems fixed for the ob6 because i'm really excited to hear that mm. yeah it does it does really uh, well it, it's supposed to with the name isn't it but it does really add a vintage feel to it, it yeah, it's okay. like with, with i i do like obviously a lot of like recreating 80s songs and stuff like that and i found that with, with this edition it, it's become a lot more useful to me it, it sits in that you know it sounds authentic so yeah I, well, you know, the, the, the Prophet 6 is a great synthesizer, and if you do like the Prophet 5 vibe, it does get, get you a little more in that direction. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the nice things, too, is if you've got sound sets on your synthesizers, uh, the vintage is a little bit more subtle in what it does. And so when you go into globals and you switch it from slot to vintage, it changes your sounds a little bit. And I was playing through mine, and, and most of them sounded just fine. Like, there wasn't a huge amount of difference. Um, there's only one or two presets uh, out of the bank that were affected. But they didn't sound bad. They just didn't sound as extreme as what I had done with, with Slop. So it I all thought they sounded really great. Well. I've got Chris's sound, sound bank, and uh, I, I was testing it when, when this update came, and I, I thought they sounded really good. Mm. Uh, good, good. Well. So, Dominic, have you got any skin in this game? Well, yeah, to round off the nice binary collection of owners, I've got both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't installed it yet, given, <laughs> given oh, I, wasn't, yeah. I wasn't able to do anything last week. Oh, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, I can't wait. That's at like, the top of my list. I'm, I'm um, really excited about the MIDI implementations as well on there. Um, and might be worth, if we run out of topics, just uh, recommendations for a controller mm. that's running... Um, 
the MP style stuff and all that kind of thing um, because I don't have one. But uh, the uh, they're both they're both amazing synths. I've always been a Prophet fan over an Oberheim fan, and I know lots of people you know rate that the Oberheim stuff is always. Uh, well, it's Japan versus Ultravox, isn't it? I guess you know. It's that kind <laughs> yeah, of, yeah. Um, but th- it's always a little bit brittle sounding. It cuts brilliantly in a simple minds kind of cutting way. But there's something a bit more uh, esoteric or earthy, I think, about the Prophet. So I can't wait to try it. But the the principle, as I understand it, um, has been around for a bit, and I'm I'm kind of hoping we'll see this the more the FPGA synths start coming out. And it's just the idea if you've got if you make an, an oscillator circuit, isn't that complicated out of components you know so you could Mm. model that oscillator circuit which is what everyone does but when you put say a few resistors in that circuit each of those resistance has at best like a 10 percent tolerance um and so the value of the resistor will change by up to 10 percent and then as you heat it up it might get a bit more closer to the proper level or not and and it's putting these little tolerances um kind of sonically if you like in in the programming of the thing so rather than just saying well we'll turn the slop up and that will randomly detune and pan all these oscillators and they'll be slightly different each time we slop it but you know basically it's a random number what we're going to do is we're actually going to randomize the bits one layer in than that you know so mm-hmm. i think it was diva was one of the first plugins that was actually modeling the circuits of the synths using a um uh, uh, you know, an electronic modelling package that you would use if you were designing and testing circuits, mm. and using that to produce the sounds, which suddenly made it sound kind of better than everything else at the time. And then, if we start building in those tolerances, and um, and the fact that they're not stable, they will move. Not only will they drift slowly over the time, they'll kind of LFO a little bit, mm-hmm. depending on what's going on. And and mm. mimicking that, I think, will get us probably closer to analog than. Analog, actually, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Um, you know, yeah. so, uh, so I can't wait to try it out, and I can't wait to see more of this. Um, yeah, yeah, and yeah as time and one goes of the on. most important features of this, I think, is that whereas in the '80s and and you know, anytime you're using the anal- old analog synthesizers, like you don't have any control of what it does as far as like how sloppy the tuning is really yeah so with with some of these it's nice because you can you can tighten it off and turn this feature off or or turn it down i should say um and have a tighter modern analog synth or you know start adding this in and and the moog one has a a pitch variance also feature and so you can get it really tight where you couldn't on those older ones but then also you can loosen it up and you know and it'd be nice if uh, sequential does it it's right now it's in the globals so it's like a four button press or so uh to to switch them on and off but it'd be nice if they implemented it on a per patch basis if you wanted to go to slop or vintage Mm -hmm. but being able to do it by patch is really nice because sometimes you want that like really tight and other times you just want it loose and warm and just way out there I got it on them um, on my Roland MKS80. There's a tune button, and um, basically you'd find a sound in there, and you'd work with that sound, and it sounding great. And normally it would be, you wouldn't be recording it; it would be running live over MIDI, and everything would be kind of chunking on. And uh, and then you'd press the tune button, and everything would sound small again because everything would just go. <laughs> everything really tight again <laughs> and so that's like having the, a, a switch on and off slop a, a, like a time delay one and it would sound better and better and better and so when we used to work with it all the time it would be like don't touch the tune button you know it's, <laughs> it's still getting better it's still getting better. <laughs> <laughs> and every, but everything really just sucks together and you realize just subconsciously how this tiny little movement so it wasn't it was out of tune it was just nicely yeah. kind of yeah earthy i guess it's the proper mm. word ben i'm getting that clicking over your mic again so I don't know if there's anything you can do. Can you hear that? Is that just that's not just me, is it? No, I, I can hear uh, it as well. So if I go like this, you can't hear yeah. it anymore, can you? Yeah. yeah. And that's that's definitely you, Ben. Oh, it's gone there. It's gone. Don't move. Stay I there. Hear anything. <laughs> yeah. It's it's like a like a clock clicking type thing. Um yeah. It's anyway. Yes. Anyway, so there you go. That's um the uh the new OS, it's in beta version at the moment, um, I believe. I think I called the wrong page up when I did that. But anyway, um, yeah, it's uh, still in beta for the Prophet 6 and the OB6. So it'll be interesting to see um, once that all gets sorted out and how well that works for everyone. 
Um, let's do this. This next one, um, I've got to say, is one of my favourite things that I found on the internet uh, this week. I, I didn't find it. it. It was brought to my attention by uh, by Dave Spears um, from G4 Software, who I must say, I've seen a lot of things coming out of G4 Software this last couple of weeks. It looks like they're ramping things up. They're mm. advertising for developers and they're doing. They're, they were sending out questionnaires, so that's really interesting. I can't wait to see what. Well, uh, Chris I've seen and, that and Dave got planned. They have uh, something that's in the works that will be coming out. Uh, they've mentioned it on KVR, I believe, in a thread that they've got two projects that they're working on, and one right. will be pretty soon, I guess. Yeah, that's good. I understand mm. it. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but that Dave, is. <coughs> Dave hasn't been kind of social mediaing for a while, obviously because they're kind of busy and stuff. But he did pop up the other day and posted a link. Uh, to to this and this is just incredible fun and it's just so good so this is blob opera which is part of the google arts and culture um service that they've got up there and um it's basically it's this this wonderful thing where you just drag the the players and they play in you know in, in tune with each other and you can also use vocalizations So you have you know, the bass guy, then you have the tenor guy. And then comes the mezzo-soprano. And finally the soprano. Oh, it's not picking it. There we go. No, come on. There we go. It's just great to look at and great to hear. It's such good fun. And, and then whilst you're playing this, especially if you're doing this on a, oh, they've got random applause. Um, you can mute certain elements. So it basically works from left to right. So if you go for the soprano, they'll all sing in um, in tune. Um, but you can then mute some of them so they don't. And so you can get kind of creative with this. The best thing about this is that if you um, hook up a MIDI, if you've got a MIDI controller, you can MIDI, you can use this on the keyboard. So you can play yeah. this on the keyboard as well. It's great, great <laughs> I didn't fun. know that. Yeah. Um, oh, man. So, yeah, it's... I lost two hours on this. this it is. <laughs> Good job I didn't know that. I know. <laughs> you can... <laughs> totally gone. It, it just... Uh, and it works great on a mobile device as well. I've had it on my iPhone. We've tried it on the wife's iPad. You can record your performance. Yeah. They've even got um, a bunch of... Christmas carols that so uh, obviously this yeah. has been out for a little yeah. while and you can choose from a playlist um so that's that is a uh, blob <laughs> opera which you can just uh, go to the the google arts and culture website so it's artsandculture.google.com and this is one of the experiments in there I do love this kind of stuff. Um, there's there's been a number of kind of web, you know, browser based fun musical instruments, but this one. Uh, any thoughts on this? It, it's really well done, isn't it? it yeah. yeah. It actually, like I tried to mess it up and I couldn't. It was just like <laughs> it was staying harmonious all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Despite what you did, and it, I don't know. Every, everything follows what you're doing, doesn't it? The, mm. the others go go off in, in into like alternate harmonies, and it all works. It's it's really clever whatever's going on in the background. Yeah. It's astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I would say it was a coda. What were your thoughts? Yeah, it's just, it's just astonishing, isn't it? It's like, um, I mean, the the graphics, actually, I can drop it out a little bit. Oh, no, maybe it's me. Uh, the, the, the graphics are incredible. And then you think, okay, so maybe I'm getting swayed by the graphics here. Maybe mm. the sound's kind of okay. You know, and so you ignore the graphics. It sounds actually really good. You know, yeah. um, and then you realise, hang on a minute, this is running in a browser. Mm -hmm. You know, this is fundamentally JavaScript calls here. You know, doing stuff yeah. in something that's really designed to just originally to do text documents. You know, you think you think about Google Sheets and about how much better still Excel is from Google Sheets, although it's getting close now. Yeah, and then you look at some kind of game written on, a, on, on one of the decent engines compared to that you're actually not far off you know this no. thing's doing um, not only the, just the audio work but the, the the visuals and the graphics and reading mm. the stuff i don't know what's going on in the background but it's saying these aren't the voices of the that they've used original great singers who've sat mm. there and they've kind of fed in these samples so 
So if you were building a sample library, think along those lines. But then mm -hmm. they've used the AI to look at those samples and reproduce them. So what they're saying is you're not hearing the sound of those people. We haven't built a big multi-sample instrument and then jumped around. What we're mm -hmm. doing is um, we're using AI to say right now produce a waveform at a pitch with a uh, phoneme or whatever they call it yeah. about you know the the, the mouth shape um, depending on where the mouse cursor is and that's just amazing yeah. it really is amazing because the sonic I mean even the reverb on there in mm. real time to work that in the browser is like <laughs> what's going yeah. on it's, it's crazy really <laughs> clever really yeah. clever it's very good I wonder, Chris, I wonder, I, I was getting um, inspired sorry Chris I, I was just saying I was getting all kinds of inspiration when I was messing around with it thinking can I use this in anything? Mm. Like, will, 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 they, yeah. will they complain if it, <laughs> it's like this choir suddenly kicks in on one of these? I was thinking with the sleep app and the sleep, you know, ambient sleep music generation stuff. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Just, uh, just leave it running in the background and yeah. it just you know it doesn't have to be voices if it can do yeah. that really easily with just voices like that it could just be sitting there generating yeah. relaxation stuff you know mm, great. definitely yeah, really good yeah it says here um they developed this machine learning model trained on the voices of four opera singers um and recorded 16 hours of singing to uh to then go ahead and get that machine learn it's, yeah it, i mean it's great stuff and the fact that it works not only on um you know, just in a regular browser, but it works on, on an iPhone or an iPad. Yeah. And, you know, it's, uh, what I'd like to see, a variation of that, is that if you have four people and they each get a blob each and then you can perform together, but they it intelligently <laughs> keeps everything in tune. And oh, it just makes yeah, it a whole, yeah. you know, much more interactive experience. That'd and, be great, you, know, yeah. you know, the technology exists for that. So that would be yeah. cool. But, uh, yeah, it's it's really fun to see. I kind of want to meet the guy who's, who said, uh, sorry, who said, I'll tell you what, what this needs, we need to draw some blobs. It's great, it sounds great, and all that. Yeah, yeah I get it, yeah. I get it, right? I'm doing the map, but you know, what we need is some blobs. <laughs> who, who, who said this sounds like a great idea? <laughs> yeah, what was that I'm meeting paid, like? Yeah. I'm paying for it, smoking? sounds rubbish, <laughs> but yeah, some blobs. it does work. I'm sure it was that way around because he didn't draw the blobs and then go, What we need is some opera. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so as I'm thinking about topics that I wouldn't be able to get a word in edgewise, I wouldn't have predicted this one. <laughs> so I, I don't know if you guys uh, had this experience also, but uh, you know, my wife and I are both working at home, and so she's a room over, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm you know, Robbie sends a link, and I'm I'm playing around with this thing. I'm like, this is really great, and uh, must have had the door open or something because she she wanders in thinking I'm working on something really serious, <laughs> you know, music wise. And then, and then you just see that on the screen. <laughs> <Blobs. laughs> yeah. I think she was a little bit disappointed. <laughs> Is this what you do all day? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and on the weekends too. <laughs> and now this, this would be interesting. Mike, Mike um, Hydra Pneumatic. So I want to see a craft ver uh, version. <laughs> that would be good. Yeah. That would be good. Definitely. Um, that look like yeah. you just have ties. Yes, mm. just black suits and ties, and well, standing at lecterns doing their accounts. That is quite <laughs> interesting because because we're forgetting we're all getting excited about the sound. Well, I was anyway. The sound of the thing and the controllability, <laughs> but it's mimicking fairly typical operatic. It's more like monastic monk singing, yeah, you know, isn't it? You know that, that that kind of monastic, which is reasonably predictable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not going to be as predictable as some, but you could take genres of music and apply those. Um, you know, if it's that good already in a browser, like I said, mm, yeah. um, a craftwork star thing or an EDM star thing or whatever, you can suddenly start getting really quite close. Where where it's quite exciting for me is in the arrangement <coughs> side of things. So uh, knowing when things should change, particularly if you're looking at EDM or techno or something like that, um, which tends to have obviously a fairly the same all the way through, but the, the, the ups and the downs and the drops are the vital part of the whole thing. Um, getting AI to predict where it should go next, what to what to come in, what to drop out, based on everyone else's tune. I mean, we all do it. I've looked on Beatport and looked at someone else's arrangement. I'm going, oh, yeah, 16 bars of that, and eight bars of that, and he's brought that back in again, you know, and you can come mm. up with the templates really easily. But getting an AI version of that to do it automatically would be quite, quite cool. Yeah. Mm. No, yeah. The, the possibilities are endless. I, I just thought it was just a really cool, fun thing to do, and the fact that you can... Uh, operate it over MIDI as well. Um, mm. I, I bet some people could get some clever things going with that. It'd be it's amazing where, that goes. where the whole thing's going, though, isn't it? The software yeah. thing. I, mm. I've been like quite heavily involved in uh, messing with spectral layers the past like 
okay few days and uh, and just where software's going you know being able to go into the dna kind of thing of mm. a track and just pull individual noises out not frequencies actual you use photo photoshop type tools to draw mm. around a, a percussion element and then tech it out the full track after yeah. it's mixed it's like it's this just is what going, I, <coughs> 10 whenever years I, it's going to be unbelievable isn't yeah. it whenever whenever i play with um isotopes rx8 and some of the tools that you get in that it mm. that's an incredible thing i, I had mm. We had a complaint the other day at work. Um, one of my colleagues recorded a voiceover for a module, and she must, I don't know, she lives in uh, Illinois somewhere, and but she sounded like she was in a bathroom. You know, the, the reverb was there. So mm. I said, don't worry, I've got, a, I've got a tool for that. So <laughs> use the thing. But then I start, I just kind of got carried away because you see that list of, of different things that you can do and mess around with the audio. Mm. I wonder what happens if I use that as well. And you just, yeah. you get lost down this rabbit hole of, of wondrous sonic. And you think, wow, this is amazing because you can literally just pick bits out of audio that you could never dream of doing before. It was just incredible yeah. stuff. You'd be able Talking to do of, that in a browser soon. Yeah. <laughs> wow, well, yeah. Exactly. It'll get there, won't it? It'll get yeah. there. Talking of, um, of clever pieces of software, this is one that um, has just been updated. It's called Edison. And I want to give this a bit of a shout. I think I've probably mentioned this before. Um, it's a guy by, uh, goes by the name of Sean Luke, um, who I say goes by the name, probably is his name. Um, but it's a synthesizer patch editor. It's on version 26, and he's just added some new features to it including some kind of morphing uh, stuff that allows you to uh, you know, kind of morph between uh, various elements of the, the synthesizer's um, uh, features. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a cough in my throat. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and yeah, it just kind of makes that kind of shifting between different parameters very easy. It supports a very wide range of, of mostly vintage synthesizers. Uh, and you can probably see why I'm a big fan of this because of um, the fact that it covers most of the Yamaha DX range. But um, there's one for your uh, PSN mm. bingo. But um, it's completely free of charge. And it has this very nice kind of flat um, uh, in interface that is uh, is just very simple and it works. It really does. And it's, it's completely free. And it's just up to, um, say, version 26 infinite levels of undo uh randomization merging weighted comp recombination of two patches of your choice blending nudging morphing hill climbing and constriction all of this kind of stuff and he's adding to it and and, and tweaking it all the time and improving it um and it's just a, a brilliant little thing now somebody did say uh, in the uh process network page oh but it's java and yeah it is um but it works and it does a really good job. And of course, the best part about it is it's free. Have, have any of you guys had a chance to try this and, and maybe run it against anything that you've got uh, hardware wise in your studios? Well, I thought that uh, nothing I had was supported on it, but I've just spotted the microwave too. So I'll, uh, I, <laughs> I will download nice. it and try it. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, report back next week. Yeah, that'd be interesting to know. Chris, did, have you had a go with this yet? Uh, no, it doesn't support anything that i have no. <laughs> yeah I, 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 through this, I just double checking it but yeah no it doesn't have yeah. anything that i have yeah, i guess it is kind of for people like me that um wallow in vintage synthesizer land um dom is this yeah it, well i wasn't aware of it um which is which is surprising and uh i think it looks great and and i with my code i had a quick look at the code because it's open source which is mm -hmm. just yeah. brilliant and um and full marks to this guy it doesn't matter that it's java i think i actually even more impressed that he's going to <laughs> it java to be honest i mean the only thing with java is it's completely cross-platform so you can run it on abs mm, absolutely yes. anything and that, exactly. that's a good thing so yeah. it, it it lacks a bit sometimes in terms of um optimization perhaps but who cares when you're just talking about midi signals um mm. and there are uh uh two or three things in there that i do own um i've not got into having um library editor stuff for ages now mm. um i got the kiwi synth patch editor a long time ago if you ever come across them i got a kiwi make mm. uh jx3p um kiwi boards and right. uh you know 106 i mean he's rewritten the firmware for a lot of this old stuff and yeah. and he built what really was the jx3p programmer size 
uh, square thing, but he built in control for the MKS 80 and the MKS 70 and all sorts of stuff. So right. I bought one of those and it mm -hmm. really does the job. So I use that and I record any of my tweaks into Logic or Ableton from, from there. Mm -hmm. So I've not really had the need to, um, to do much tweaking or if I've needed to alter something, I've grabbed the knob and recorded the knob movement. Mm -hmm. But this is actually quite nice to have sitting there because it'll probably bring back to life a couple of synths I haven't used for ages that don't have that kind of um, control available to them. Yeah, there is a, it's a really, um, so this, this lovely kind of clean interface um, that is not showing up on, on the screen because I think it's just some kind of browser thing. But um, it, it's kind of consistent all the way through. And I got it um, when I got the FS1R because, you know, that, that you have like something like 2,000 parameters mm. per patch. Um, having something like this, you know, compared to, you know, working off an interface mm. that's um, as bad as that, it, it really does make a difference. Um, but, yeah, it's, and I say, you know, it, it's free. It's, you know, the other two really nice good. bits that I, I saw is that, it does this randomized patch generation, which is much of a muchness, but it'll do merging. So it'll mm. it'll merge between two patches to the one in the middle, or it'll move you to, from one patch towards another. Another, I think he calls it nudging. Mm. So that that kind of stuff can be interesting if you've yeah. got a bass sound that you know you want to add a bit more boom to, and you on a DX7, it'd be interesting to kind of push a sort of slappier sound yeah. towards one of the more stubbier sounds and see where it where it yeah, takes you. Definitely, I like that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I just wanted to kind of you know give that a bit of airtime because it's a mm. it's a wonderful endeavor. So if you want to go and avail yourself of this, it's hey, it's completely free of charge. It's open source. It's on GitHub.com forward slash eclab forward slash edisync. Um, yeah, I posted about it on the uh, on our Facebook page, so you should be able to find it in there. But it's um, yeah, it's a really clever little bit of code and very useful. And I uh, just thought I would put that out there. Um, right, so. Uh, let's have a look. Let's <clears throat> let's get this week's Behringer news out of the way, shall we? Because there is a bit of it, and it's actually for for a change. It's positive, and you know maybe slightly uplifting as well. It depends how it floats your boat. Um, so let's have the the first bit of of Behringer news, which I think is going to be very good for our friends the other side of the Atlantic, and that is that um, Behringer have now signed this deal. To become uh, or to, you know, with Sweetwater to become a super partner, which basically means that um, those people over there in America, uh, and I guess that's the continent of North America, not just the, the, the USA, but Canada and everywhere else too, are going to benefit from um, more rapid deployment of uh, the new products as and when they come out, and of course, uh, more competitive pricing. So they've gone all in uh, with Sweetwater. Um, so there's this big press statement um, from Uli and Chuck Sirac uh, from Sweetwater about how they're going to integrate and everything, and then um, you yeah, that, know that's going to going to mean you know huge improvement to the service levels over there in the U.S. But also um, what it has also prompted is this sudden price drop in uh, Behringer pedals over at the Sweetwater website. So if you want an effects pedal, you're in the U.S. 19 bucks for any one of these um and even some of the the more expensive ones have come right down so the uh, the v-tone acoustic driver di pedal is now just 29 bucks um so some of the other stuff there the vintage tube monster is just 79 now so instant kind of benefits and um uh, to be had for for behringer customers over there in the u.s so let's go to our u.s correspondent <laughs> over there in california Obviously, guitar pedals are going to be interesting to you, um, but also the fact that Behringer synths are now going to be more readily available and probably at a much more competitive price. Yeah, I mean, uh, so the guitar pedals are, these ones are not be uh, up my alley, really. But it's nice that there's, there'll be some competition for the Amazon ones and people that are getting into music. I mean, when I started playing guitar, uh, you know, it wasn't easy because I, I needed to buy gear, and as a teenager, didn't you know? I think I started playing when I was fourteen, and I had to get a job after that to start getting gear. <laughs> so this this makes it nicer. I mean, instead of buying a, a I mean, at the time, like whatever it was, seventy nine dollars or something for a Boss pedal to be able to get something for nineteen dollars to get you going would have been nice. I think for for myself and probably a lot of other synth players, though, th just I mean, Behringer's synthesizers are already cheap, so that's not an issue. But 
um, the availability of them in the United States is, has largely been the problem. And we've talked about this before. So, you know, friends in Europe are waiting to get Moog stuff or, and uh, we're waiting to get Behringer stuff. Or, or like right now I'm waiting for a modal synthesizer that I've had on back order yeah. for, let's see, over a month now. Uh, and that was from Sweetwater. So, you know, I'm just waiting, waiting to hear. So anytime a companies, you know, can get, get some of these great new products um, shipped all over the world a little bit quicker. That that's a win-win for the you know win for the company, win for the users. Um, so yeah, let's see let's see what yeah. happens with it. I think it's I think it's going to be good. Yeah, definitely, and yeah, it's, it put some positive news um, for our American cousins. But also, there's this um, this other revelation today, and so it is just or not today, uh, the other day um, is just a proof of concept at the moment. It's not. Um, formally announced or anything but people have been screaming for a new bcr controller and it looks like behringer have listened because um this is a prototype for the bcr 32 not only is this a recreation or an update to the the old bcr 2000 but there was a very popular um firmware upgrade third party firmware upgrade upgrade called the the sequencer i think i've pronounced that correctly or the Zakunser, and this turned it into a very powerful 32-step sequencer with, of course, um, all the connectivity that the BCR gave you. So they've seemingly done a deal with these guys at Zakunser, and this is now built in as standard. So, uh, or that's certainly how they they want to sell this. Um, you get the the 32 rotary controllers. There's 16 uh, buttons there as well uh, above and then you've got uh, different encoded groups and then you've got your typical kind of uh, menu stuff and a small little it looks like an lcd or an oled screen of some description yeah. um the uh, a lot of people have yeah it's, the the response to this has been very very big and very very positive some people are saying maybe you know instead of having just um screen printed labels on here we we have uh digital scribble strips but i think then you're going to start pushing the price up because behringer claimed that they can put this out for 149 dollars which is impressive um mm. and as far as connectivity is concerned on the back uh you've got you know the usual suspects are all there you've got midi uh you've got usb you've got foot switches you've got sync and then you've got c four cv and gate output so this is uh, really going to be useful for the modular crowd as well as um other people using it for just pretty much anything um i've i've seen some of these have, have been adapted there was a an oberheim um third party firmware for, i think it was for this yeah, for the bcr um the 2000 and you had a, there was an overlay for it and it just got into you know programming i think it was an obx or the obx range um and that was quite a popular thing but don do you use these these kinds of controllers I and, do. and does this interest I do. you i i managed to track down the bcr and i think it's a bcf with the that's right yeah one. so i've got one of each because there isn't anything around there's a massive gap in the market there as far as i can see mm. and they are a bit they're, they're really they're brilliant it's a flying faders on them yeah. um but they're, they're a bit clunky and they're a bit old but there really isn't anything like them and the sequencer i haven't got it installed installed on mine but it's a great job these guys are just reverse engineered and just put in a a step sequencer in there which is great the mm. reason i was using them was because i like kind of dubby effects on stuff i, I love dub and mm. uh i like the idea of uh mixing and being able to flip on echo on the fly and then have the echo coming back on another channel and to be able to turn back the feedback on itself so that i can really play the mixing desk a bit it's not much to ask and actually mm. in a door that's really hard to do mm. um because you can buy things with fades on yeah. and you can buy things with knobs on but you can't buy uh something with a with a channel and a pan and three aux send knobs on so i want four knobs here and a, and a, and a channel here unless you mm. combine two things like the bcr and the, and the the behringer stuff was the cheapest way of doing that there's the PC12, the Fader Fox PC12. Now I'm not going to move it because yeah. I'll probably break it. I've got one there. You can buy one of those and you can buy the Fader version of that and you've got effectively an expensive uh, controller that does what I want. But really what I want to be able to do is control the mixing desk in my door with a, a, a few faders, mm -hmm. some aux sends, um, and then you can basically play the desk when you were used to do like remixes and, and dub mixes really easily and there's just yeah. nothing around that, 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 that does that. 
that I've come across that works well. Um, and I think this will go there if they can do a fader version as well. Um, mm. And I dropped him a note. And I said, "Look, this is a, a while ago. Actually, I, I just sent the, they got the. They seem to listen occasionally when people send them stuff." Yeah. And I said, "Look, I can't find this, and I've got two of these things, and they are a bit old and clunky, but they do do the job. This is this mm. is what I'm desperate for." Um, so that's that's why, and I think it's um, I think it's a, a great bit of kit. I mean, if yeah. you go just go back to the Sweetwater deal as well, there's something that sort of um, always. I appreciate about Behringer's work, which people don't seem to sometimes forget, which is their dealer price must be caning them, getting them out to the shops at a dealer price and maintaining those prices. Mm. So this makes sense. I mean, if I'm, let's say I'm a, I'm a software manufacturer making a, a Moog copy and there's lots of them around, um, I've got my development costs, I've got to code the thing, and that could be as much or as little as I want. I could be me in a bedroom or I could be a team of 20 developers. In general, you're probably looking at three or four people. Um, and I've got my product. And I have to get it out and I test it. And then from that point on, I don't know, Arturia sells for 150 I think, for the MOOC. Yeah. Um, there's no distribution costs and there's uh, there's no problem if you want to update it, if it's broken or whatever. And that's almost pure profit. Um, there are some dealer costs if you're going to go through Plugin Boutique or whatever. I presume they're taking some markup. But generally, massive amount of profit in that. Whereas Behringer are producing one for the same $150. They've got the R&D in order to design the thing. They've got to buy the parts and build the jigs to make them, manufacture them, package them, ship them to the stores and sell them for a 40% discount to the store. And you're looking at something for $150. Well, knock off the tax on that to 130 knock off the 40%, you're down to about, what, 70 60 $70. You've got to mm. get them out to the stores, ship them from their country to America. They're probably making, what, $20 a pop on something like that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really brave. You know, whatever mm. you think about the company, and you know, everyone's ripping off everyone else, including the, the software manufacturers get far too... Uh, nice a break in my mind <laughs> because they're making a ton more profit than anyone else on the yeah. whole thing and looking um whiter than white but but doing a deal like this with sweet towards means that they're shipping they can just bang it all in huge craters all in one go they can store the stuff in the us um their margin will be better because they're yeah. probably in it 50 50 or whatever do you know yeah. what i mean it's, it's a win-win for everything and i presume i think servicing gets covered on that side as well so I guess, yeah. you know there's yeah. you can go somewhere and actually get something fixed or swapped out or or, mm. or whatever so i think it's, yeah. it's a good thing yeah it I is yeah i thing. mean it's, it's long been a fascin uh, not a fascination um a mystery to me how you know the bcr and the bcf I remember when they first came out and people lost their collective shit over this stuff because it was cheap. It, like you said, the faders were flying faders. It was just like, how can they do this? And it's so useful. And they, they are everywhere. Every studio I've been in, I think, has got at least one of those somewhere, whether it's a dedicated controller for one little thing or whether they use it as a universal. It's, and then they stopped making them, I don't know how many years ago, and they are built like tanks and they yeah. last, and there's a third-party network behind them developing cool things, which obviously they've tapped into with this. So, you know, hats off to them for actually listening because they've, people have been crying out for this. Yeah. And I hope that there is a, a BFR, or BCF, sorry, um, with the faders, and that they replicate that because that's one thing. I mean, I've got one of these um, Korg Nano Controls. It's an old, you know, the, 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 the very first one. And, you know, it's nice, but it's a little flimsy and the short throw faders, they're not very mm. nice. And I always remember, I used to use that when I did um, online radio. And uh, if I used it for something else, I had to go, go back and do all the settings. So having some kind of recall would be really nice. Um, but they were just, you know, I, I just thought, oh, if I could pick myself up a BCF. But, you know, the, everybody wants them. They're so thin on the ground, mm. you know. So, um, Chris, do you use uh, these kind of MIDI controllers in your work? Is this something that you might be interested in? So I don't, but um, I do think this is a really interesting product, and um, one of the things that I liked about it is that they did do at least that uh, LED ring around it. Yeah. Uh, and I, as I'm thinking about possible uses, the one thing that I, I consistently don't care about with um, hardware controllers is that you don't know where stuff is at. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, you're relying on something on screen, and if you're you're working on several things at once and your your screen real estate is limited, you might not be able to have everything up on there or you're switching back and forth between them. And so to be able to check a, a parameter and see where it's at just by, you know, looking down at it is a very nice feature. 
and uh, you know that scribble strip idea uh, so uh, of course like this is a this is a very inexpensive product and they should do this one but maybe uh, another one down the road that's a little more uh, you know we had a conversation about it recently was it last week maybe about a kind of universal uh, yeah. synth programmer for soft synths mm -hmm. that if they took this idea and they start expanding it out into other types of controllers like I, the one that I had thought of was I was like well they they should do a fader one I didn't know when it existed before until mm. until Dom had said it so uh, something like that you know add that add a nicer one that has scribble strips that is totally programmable mm -hmm. uh, I said the the uh, network of people using it will create stuff for it and templates it could be a quite a useful thing and then when you figure that this thing is not three or four hundred dollars and that it's only uh, it's under 150 US mm. that's pretty remarkable so yeah. this is something that I would keep my eye on and see also what other products they come out after this because those uh, the BCR is one of the uh, products I, I I most hear lamented by synth synth and yeah. uh, people saying why don't they make this anymore and, mm. and uh, seriously I've heard tons of people say that well now they're going to so that's good yeah. at least they're, they, they're listening on this account yeah absolutely um, ben, <clears throat> does this um, appeal to you? Yeah, I just like really echo what everybody else is saying. Really, uh, I don't think I've got anything else to add. It's uh, I just think it'd be like really useful. Like you get people using them for all kinds. Uh, you know the old mm. ones, and even like using them as like like sort of custom light controllers and everything. Yeah, you can you can just you can just it is do multidisciplinary, with them. isn't it? You yeah. can use anything that takes MIDI, yeah. which a lot of things do. I, yeah. I, I think I think for me in here it'd be really useful, you know, mm. because I, I've got like, uh, you know, how you can do like your MIDI mapping on stuff. I've got like yeah. half of the controls on one device, half the controls yeah. on something else, and I'm juggling and it, just having the the one unit for all that kind of like synth tweaking would be great for me. That's what I'd mm. use it for. Yeah, but yeah, definitely. And, and the it's it's super value because like the the, the is like what 88 quid or something and, and you get in all this increased functionality above that you know just for yeah you know, a little bit more really definitely it's really good Re yeah. really good As value they it's definitely living up to their um their little logo symbol <laughs> yeah, yeah we yeah. hear you yeah because you can guess what i got the other day Cardinal. yeah i thought i, I thought that cheese. was a block yeah. of cheese <laughs> yeah. it is it is a block of 90s g's uh no it's, it's good fun actually uh, i managed to pick yeah. it up yeah. um like barely used for like 85 quid i thought wow. excellent yeah. so I have one I've of those i've seen some nice modded versions <laughs> mm. pictures of modded versions around which i find quite interesting in yes the, the yeah little, the old devilfish mods there must be a lot of space in there i haven't opened it yeah. up yet but there must be a lot of space in there because it's very light yeah there's not a huge amount going on i suppose and the board must be fairly small um so the, the this BCR, um, I said, we haven't mentioned this yet. So um, it features this tool, uh, the the Zequencer or the Zequencer. I don't know how that's pronounced. Uh, it's a German uh, guy that's uh, come up with this. First of all, can I just draw everyone's attention to this really depressing um, opening statement on the web page? As of the first of January, twenty twenty one, Zach Audio is not selling to the UK anymore. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming that's Brexit related, but um, here, there you go. That's the way of the world now. Um, but yeah, so they, they they've had this this thing that's been out for some while. I wasn't. You know, I'm not particularly f f uh, familiar with it. Ben Jordan has done did a great video that kind of got me up to speed. I do like Ben Jordan's channel. If you haven't checked that out, do so. Um, but it's uh, it's only like 79 euro for this firmware, and it just um, completely changes your, your BCR into this 32 step four channel sequencer and the stuff that Ben was doing with this thing you know you just you know randomized notes and and you can have it all set to different keys and, and uh, chromatic scales and yeah it's just a r lot of fun and hats off to Behringer for seeing seeing the potential there and, and I'm guessing they've done a proper deal it's Certainly on the Behringer web uh, or the, the the press announcement that they've said they've um, it's a partnership or a whatever. I think so, they'd have to. That it's not yeah. open source or anything. So exactly. Yeah, so credit where credit's due. Um, 
looking forward to to seeing um, that as it appears. I mean, obviously that is a concept they said. It might not look like that. It might not behave in the way they said. But yeah, it's it's all. If it's there. got some faders on the bottom, I think it would look brilliant. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe. I mean, no. <laughs> maybe they do say an expanded version, which can you know contains yeah, both. Clip you on. Know. Yeah, be, be lovely. Something in yeah. Can you imagine uh, you know something like that 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 fits together like the roly blocks and yeah, stuff? Yeah. That'd be that'd be very cool. But I'm sure that would push the uh, the price up. Um, so what should we do next? We've only got a couple of things before we kind of get into the discussion, which is good. Okay, so um, let's have a look at this, which is a a new plugin for the um, Korg Log um, system. So you can use this on a mini log, a pro log, an NTS one, um, and it's by the wonderfully named Hammond Eggs Music. Um, they've done a whole bunch of stuff, and this is Cabinet, uh, which is an overdrive distortion plugin with an optional cabinet simulator for your log SDK compatible synthesizers. I've I did want to try and dig out the old, the old guitar and stick it through this, but I haven't had a chance. Chris, do you have any log compatible? Uh, devices that you could use this on. He's shaking his head there. No, oh, no. Well. won't go to our guitar expert for this one straight away. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you've got this. Uh, it has the the delay effect has three functions, um, and then the cabinets available from the lowest value to the highest: a combo, a two by twelve, a four by twelve, a megaphone, and a a none option. Um, but it's free. Uh, obviously, it's donationware. So if you do find this useful, do please donate. Um, but there is a, uh, a demonstration video, so, or uh, just a quick trailer. So let's just play that so people can uh, hear what it does. And I need to go to that tab just there. Share this. Now, if we're going by demo, that sounds pretty, pretty good. Yeah. And, you know, it's free. And if you've got one of these little things, uh, it's a such an inexpensive way to get some superb quality effects in there. Um, Dom, are you a, a log user at all? I am, yeah. I've got exactly the same as you, the mini one, which I yeah. just think is wonderful. And I'd had it mm. for ages um, before someone pointed out to me that you could upload this stuff and there was an <laughs> SDK for it. I was just like, what were you talking about? Because I was chatting to uh, a couple of people about um, FPGAs again, which is obviously mm. the future of the world, and about how I wanted to learn more about it and you know, how, where can I get one and can I write something simple on it? And um, it was saying, well, actually, I've just been writing some oscillators for the for the SDK for the lows. It's like, wow, wow, this is incredible. Um, and I've, it's kind of opened up a whole new a new world of, of, of learning, really, that you can do this stuff. Yeah. Um, and it sounds great. It sounds really, really good. And that thing, I mean, it, it, it's the, the processor on board, the smaller one. I don't actually know if it's much bigger on the other ones, to be honest. But um, the fact that you can get this stuff working on there is, is pretty epic. Mm. Um, and it sounds it sounds excellent. And that some people were saying that theirs were noisy or something, um, but mainly that seems to be USB noise on the yeah. On the that's the only one, isn't it? yeah. It's the only thing I've heard, and it's the same with anything that's USB powered. If you get it in the wrong you know, connection, you get a, a, yeah. a, a ground loop, which you can easily eradicate with a ground loop isolator. Yeah, or, or just or better run it off a pack or a battery yeah, pack or yeah. something. But it is yeah. so. So actually, if you want to use it. Um, for something like this, then you know it's perfectly usable. I originally got it to use the effects in a modular mm. rack. Yeah. So I basically stuck it in inside my modular rack and, and had it set to um, some reverb and some delay, and it was the cheapest, best sounding thing I could think of, just to, yeah. that would fit in a modular rack. And then suddenly you find out about all this other stuff that's going on with it. And it's like mm -hmm. I say, these guys, it's free, and there are some charged ones available. Yes. Uh, from these guys, actually, I think, which are extremely mm -hmm. good, and from other suppliers, because it's, it's it's like a third party market for this mm. stuff. Um, but I'd love to see this becoming, um, you know, part of more 
uh, companies' releases where you can actually upload stuff. You know, you don't have to be techie to do it. It just allows the kind of open source world to get involved if they want to and, yeah. and produce, you know, new stuff for it rather than closing things off. And I think it's um it's a nice touch from Cork to be able to do this and open it up like that. Yeah. And, and it only ever encourages good things you know it only ever gets better because of doing that and they sell more as a result so yeah, yeah. i think it's a bit, yeah. a bit of a master stroke from cork to, to have that platform and then spread it not just across the you know the synths but you know the little nts1 as well and i'm sure there'll yeah. probably be other things it's almost yeah. like that they, they use these tools to produce them themselves and then someone actually within the company said look if we release these oh, you can't do that you know yeah, yeah yeah no but if we do it's a good thing so, <laughs> yeah. yeah okay then we'll give it a go and then suddenly Absolutely. you know yeah. it's yeah. a great thing um, ben, are you? Uh, do you have any logs? <laughs> I don't. I don't. But the more <laughs> the more I hear about what what these things are coming out, like the oscillators and the mm. effects and things, I just think, it, like you say, it's a it's a masterstroke uh, yeah. to open it up to everybody and we'll keep these the, these uh, devices, it, 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 you know, in the circuit for for years and years to come because. There'll always be something new that you can do with them, won't there? You know, it's yeah. like it, it's just continuous. It's really so, good. Yeah. So, Chris, are you tempted now that they've got some kind of like amp modeling simulation stuff to to get something like that and stick that into your your pedal board? I uh, <laughs> well, usually I, I'm either playing guitar through an actual amp or uh, oh, through you, like you something snob. like. <laughs> 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 Actually, you I, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> they, they are actually what I uh, what I record with quite a bit now is just Amplitube, and I've got a few mm. other amp modelers like uh, Soft Tube stuff, and they've gotten so good. Uh, not, and Amplitube's latest release uh, this last month, their cab section on it is phenomenal. Mm. Uh, I mean, it, it's ridiculous what you can do with it. And I, it's kind of funny when I see people, e even their older version, like with, with Amplitude 4, is like, like, well, it doesn't sound that great, or it does this, this, like, you know, it, it sounds just like what happens when you amp, when you mic up an, uh, an amplifier. So if you mic it terribly, it'll sound terrible, and if you mic it good, it'll sound good. Mm -hmm. And their new process of, of doing stuff, of matching the impedance of a, of a power amp, and then... They uh, with this current version, it's got something like a hundred and something thousand uh, impulse responses with it. So you move the microphone on a virtual grid in front of the speaker, and some things that that I that I have been waiting for because like if you mic an, uh, a speaker on the outside, like say you have a four twelve cabinet, you mic the speaker on the outside versus the inside. You're still micing the same speaker in, the, in roughly the same spot, but on the other side. But the other speakers around it are going to influence the sound. Everything like that has gone mm. into it. And so uh, with the kind of level of detail that amp modelers have now is, is absolutely astounding. And so when I'm recording, most of the time I'm not plugging in and micing my, my amplifiers and plus you got to deal with volume and things like that i'm just going into the box but being that i have that if i if i if i wanted to do something like that i don't know is is there a much of is there many people that are doing synth music where they're micing up amplifiers the, the only thing that that was really in, that has come across my mind was uh pink floyd like say back in the 70s i remember them running mini mugs mm -hmm. into whatever they were using the high watts depeche mode but depeche mode have done a lot of uh, you know like making things up. Mm, i started a whole craze time. for like putting them through incinerators about yeah, six that, oh, yeah. <laughs> that incinerator that was fantastic <laughs> <laughs> i'm doing my best yeah. <laughs> um, but no you're right i used to be the bane of my life producing guitar bands on the cheap trying to get a guitar sound if we couldn't get a decent studio where we could mic up an amp trying to yeah. You can't DI this stuff. There was no VSTs. You know, we used to build boxes to put the amp in the boxes and kind of soundproof the boxes and stuff. Yep. Oh, I, I, I'm glad nowadays you can get mm. some more decent stuff. I saw a video with Metallica on tour when they were using these, um, still using cabs. Fractal? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Things could be just sort of preset for songs in there. They were, that was pretty special stuff. Um, but yeah, no, you don't get. You sh there should be more of of outboard synths. People do route synths outboard through 
uh, preamps and that kind of stuff. But mm. I'm, I'm I'm on a mission a bit at the moment with the with the um, with the incinerator stuff and some VSTs I'm working on with somebody else that might actually just try and bring that idea of speaker cabs and valves and preamps as a not an external thing, but as a VST style thing for for specifically for synth players, because the, people just kind of get the preset out the synth and a bit of reverb and a bit of echo, and and that's it. You know, a bit of a, mm. a little bit of distortion if you're lucky, but they don't think of it so much as a guitar. When you think about the sound that comes out of a guitar when you don't plug anything into it, and then you think about the sound mm. of a guitar, the millions and billions of different sounds you can get from that one little source oscillator sound, you should mm. be able to do the same with synths, surely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. You know, for a, for a saturator, I was just playing this morning, uh, and I've got various stuff on the computer already, but uh, I was running my uh, uh, Behringer Cat uh, through a free saturator, which is um, a Bedroom Producers Blog or something like that, have oh, released yeah. a couple free plugins, and one of them was uh, like a distorted filter, and the other was a saturator, and the saturator one... Uh, it actually sounded really good on this. So I was, I was experimenting. I, I just set up like a really clean uh, square wave uh, two oscillator sound going into that saturator and dirtied it up. And I actually did it on uh, the Cherry Audio that, uh, what was it called? The, the little uh, free the, one. Uh, Radio Shack thing. Well, yeah, the surreal, yeah. Surrealistic, surrealistic, that's surrealistic. what it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that thing sounds a little too clean in my opinion. And it just felt like it needed to be a little bit grittier. And so as I was playing with it, I used a saturator on that. And it, it just it was just the perfect amount of grit to take it from that like kind of too polished sound into something yeah. that's a little just a little bit more. But I'm I'm not really into like super distorted synthesizers. That's but if you use them and you know, like kind of just just for a little bit of flavoring mm. of spice, I think it sounds mm. really good. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well there you go. Um that's ham and eggs music. Um, which is just hammeneggsmusic.ca. Go to their log plugins or log plugins, Cabernet. And in celebration, uh, I did. I, I only just check this. I've just got a, a nice bottle of Shiraz Cabernet here. So um, let me toast the uh, the release of that for them. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Any excuse. Any Such excuse. a martyr. I know. Terrible. <laughs> it's a Sunday. I really shouldn't be drinking wine on a Sunday. Um, but cheers and good health to everyone. Um, mm. So I need to lubricate my pipes because we're going to get into the discussion mode now. Um, so we we've been putting out these you know these weekly questions on the uh, on the on the Facebook page and we've get some, we get some great responses and so um, it's always good to talk these through, especially when we have esteemed guests like uh, Dominic with us as well. So um, this week's uh, question was it was kind of a two parter really. Um, so the first part of the question was, when recording, how do you decide when to fix mistakes and when to leave them in? Uh, what types of mistakes or variances do you leave alone and why? And secondly, what are some of your favourite mistakes in classic recording? So let's let's deal with the, uh, the first half of that question. Um, and we'll just go through some of the responses and then we can go through and, and talk about uh, stuff. So um, Brian Oliva says, there are no mistakes in synthesis, only undiscovered sonic experiences profound uh, ben likes his happy accidents so vicky tells me um <laughs> selecting completely the wrong kind of sound for a part and it works better than the original idea quantizing something to the wrong value and having it uh, surprising groove um roger lies is the bit in hey jude around three minutes five when you can hear maca say oh rock and roll, when he fluffed the vocals and i had to go back and listen to that and yeah it's there <laughs> three three minutes five it's there um, and then we've got some uh, loads more examples which we'll come back to uh, of classic mistakes in recordings. But um, I, you know, I think we've all done it. I think we've all, you know, gone through something and then maybe messed a setting up or accidentally changed something, or we've, uh, you know, and then you play it back and you think, oh, that sounds good. What did I do? And it's, and you realise it's it's some kind of little mistake that you've put in there and left in there. Um, but when do you think actually no I want you know I'm, I'm going to stick to this original plan or do you leave those happy little accidents in there you know what's what's the thought process so Dominic um, let's go to you first H happy accidents or mistakes do you do you like to make them do you think they add something to the creative yeah, process I openly embrace them but they don't mm. happen 
anymore. Not because I don't make <laughs> mistakes. It's just that everything's going into a computer. Yeah. I mean, these things happened back in the day when we had a tape machine and a mic and either a singer or a guitarist or something going on or a live player or I was playing live keyboards or something. And then it happens a lot. So a good producer slash engineer would, would be the, go, the guy that could drop in and out on a tape machine fast enough. So back in the day, if you're recording something and you make a mistake, like a proper mistake, like you just want to drop in a singer for one word or half a word on a perfect take, you'd literally have to run the tape, sing along with it, pop the thing into record, and then pop the thing out of record just for that little spot and it's quite an art if you can yeah. imagine yourself having to do that. that that would be that was my life for probably a good five ten years um and you get really good at it and you don't notice um if you if you get it absolutely right um but mistakes in so when you're running a take like uh, particularly say a keyboard player or or um doing something kind of strange or or you know flipping into the bridge instead of going into the chorus but suddenly the, the chord mm. sounds great or whatever absolutely keep them i mean the classic keep your mistakes is is, is things like rolling stones really i was i was lucky mm. enough to work with chris kimsey who produced some steel wheel stuff with them and a, and a, a couple of albums and, and he told me about that recording process and it was you know always have a tape running that's the main thing so these guys would just be there standing facing each other in a circle um kind of Mick would, would set the tempo by dancing around a bit and then, you know, someone else would start up and then and Richards would have a, a riff going and uh, and everything would be recording and they'd kind of kind of be looking at each other. But they wouldn't go back and then overdub stuff. That mm. that, that would be it. And and Keith Richards in particular, from what Chris was saying, is, is like, no, no, you've got to keep it like that. It's one take. And I, I love that spirit. Yeah. Because um, the whole beginning of Start Me Up is is that you get that vibe, you know, you can hear yeah. they're all just coming in, feeling it out and then just cracking into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what a live band is. You can't apply that same thing to making um, something in this room that I'm programming in Logic or whatever. I mean, I, I often play live keyboards and it gives it a live feel about it. I still probably go in and move a few notes, actually, just because I'm, I'm like that. Um, but more and more... Um, I'm kind of not correcting stuff if it's played live, but most of the stuff I do is step programmed or played in on on a grid or something. Mm. But if you've if you've got someone doing a live take, then yeah, the, the the mistakes are there. The only thing I can think of that sometimes works is if you're programming rhythmic stuff, whether it be drums mm. or or bass or keyboards, and you flip it accidentally on the grid, so it's one beat out or two beats out or something, and suddenly you find a really nice rhythm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's actually not the sort of thing that you'd come up with normally, and suddenly you think, "Ah, oh, I'm really groovy. I can do this." You know? <laughs> um, then those kind of mis uh, mistakes you keep. But but the the classic mistakes are the ones that were committed to tape, and then later someone said, "Oh, do you know what? Yeah, we're yeah. still gonna keep that." Um, there yeah. aren't so many good but ones. The, the one I picked, the one I instantly thought of was Blue Monday, um, where they, the sequencer comes in like half a step or something behind or in front. And they kept it because it just works. And you listen to it and you think, well, w w I can never figure out what that mistake is because I've, you know, I've listened to that track a gazillion times. It is, it, it's beautiful how it is. And I just can't think, well, wh where was the mistake? And then somebody <laughs> had to kind of sit, you hear this, it's that bit, and it should have been over here. And I can't, un I can't like think how that would have mm. sounded if it had been done the way they intended to yeah. do it. And it was, that's it was the just, half beat thing that's it yeah. really does work if you're getting stuck you know move your bass line or move your hi-hat line or whatever or mm. move your hi-hat pattern over onto a synth or something you know yeah. it works. i like the stuff that's left in like at the end of life on mars with david bowie and you yes. can hear a phone ringing and you know that classic stuff and he says you know turn it up some more or something like that yeah i guess with rx8 you'll be able to turn the backing tracks down and, and actually make out a lot more of this kind of stuff that's, yes that's <laughs> left in this is, this and i true. always use the the, the example this mix I did of State of Independence where we had the reels from State of Independence and you've got Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson as backing singers in there clapping and mm. you can hear them laughing where they'd comped all the backing vocals together and they kind of get to the end of the take and they laugh but and there, it, it is in there you can hear it but it's kind of lost and you don't even yeah. recognise it having listened to the masters and that kind of yeah. stuff it's just a vibe it's really yeah, absolutely. It's a really good vibe yeah Ben are you prone to mistakes do you keep them do you ditch them well, it, it, particularly when, in a live when you was reading back what I'd wrote on the thing, it sounds like I haven't got a clue what I'm doing because it's all like things <laughs> going <a> wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I've quantized things to the wrong value. I've played things to the wrong sound. 
But it, yeah, it, it is. It's like Dom says. It, it, you know, sometimes if uh, you know when you're setting something up, if something goes wrong and uh, your, your drum pattern's playing on a on a synth for some reason before you get a chance to change it, and you think, hang on, there's something in that. Mm. There's something yep. that I can get out of that. And I've done that. I've done that with a, a drum pattern, and it ended up becoming a bass line because it worked. You know, yeah. that, you know yeah. that rhythm. rhythm you know, yeah. And it's things that you would like never come up with. It's like like Dom said about moving like a, a drum pattern back a couple of beats or a percussion. You know, you got a percussion track and you just offset that, and it mm. just gives it the whole thing a completely different groove. And and half of the time it is through like not doing things properly for me. Mm. <laughs> it's like rushing. Or well, not know, understanding the tool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was when I was trying trying to learn how to use that QX3 because that was you know trying to unlearn stuff. And even you know with um, with other old vintage equipment, you know you. You just you approach it with a, a present day mindset, and you have to you know think. Hang yeah. on a minute, this is thirty years old. Why why isn't this doing what I want it to do? And you end up you know cocking it up, and sometimes it's good. And you think, ah, oh, yeah. well, there you go. I meant to do that. I'll keep that one in. Yeah. How about yeah, you, Chris? Oh, so no. I was just going to say that, that 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 explains the Blue Monday thing, doesn't it? You yeah. Because they'll be, be using like hardware sequences where yeah. it's not like totally apparent what's going to happen next because exactly because the screen's just so small. i don't know because that was recorded what uh 83 oh it yeah. came out in 83 but it m might have been recorded i can't it, remember they it used was... it to come on stage too it was yeah. a, a little groove they'd come up with that they quite liked and wasn't really wasn't it intended to, at some point to be their encore music that yeah. they would like like press the button yeah. and then just walk off stage because they just yeah. didn't see the point in encores um but the the fact that I mean it was what eighty two eighty three, so that this is very, if it was if it wasn't pre MIDI it was very early days of MIDI, mm. and so to to get all of that you know stuff working together because they were using cutting edge stuff back then it must have been you know they must have made a heck of a lot of mistakes but they're the sort of band that don't care about their mistakes. Chris, how do you feel about mistakes? <laughs> yeah, I'm all for them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you know, it, it, it seems like we're, we've kind of entered a different age. And uh, I think it was maybe uh, Dominic that said, talking about the, or if it was Ben or Robbie, I don't remember, um, moving from a tape era into a digital recording era. And there's some things that like we have to be aware of when we do that, because decisions were made for us in the tape era of recording that you wouldn't you wouldn't have to make now and so that bit like are we going to retract that or are we going to figure out if we're going to splice this stuff together or do a punch in or something we don't have to do that now so it can affect us and when we make music we're making music too cleanly and we're off oh i can just fix this i can fix it i can fix it mm -hmm. and you know these isolated tracks that are, are popping up on youtube especially the ones that are are done you know where they're playing it from the the original tape not just an rx8 where they pulled it out but especially those where you hear everything in isolation you can hear the tone of the instrument uh has really taught me a lot about like geez this is this is really off mm -hmm. um hearing john lennon play bass on helter skelter uh, mm -hmm. i think he's using the fender six like it sounds pretty crappy, you know, both in the tone and his playing, like he's out of time and places. But when you listen to the whole of the song, it sounds so good. Or, or even mm. somebody like Eddie Van Halen. I mean, if you listen to the stuff, off, some stuff off of Diver Down, which is, um, you know, like I, just listening to his guitar itself, you're thinking like, gosh, this guy is like really drunk. And he probably was. <laughs> but then you hear him and Alex together playing and all of a sudden wow, this makes a lot of sense. And so that's kind of something that I've, uh, you know, tried to think about where am I, where am I being too clean in all of this? Mm -hmm. um, and so when I'm tracking, I, I mean, the common thing that's done a lot these days, I guess, is that you, you record a, a chorus or a verse and you copy and paste it. And so one of the things that I've really s set to doing is like making every, every part of the song as different as I can like if I can manage it it's not going to take me too long so if it's guitar and bass like 100% like I'm always tracking all the way through 
uh, even if I have to fix a part, it's an, a unique part that I, I, rec I punch back in and to record that part. With Synthesizer, like that's where I'll probably do a little bit more editing or things will be a little more samey because I'm not as good. Uh, but uh, like Dom was saying, like I I'll try to play as much as I can live in, even if it's not perfect, because it's going to have some of the feel and it's just going to be, it's going to add a little bit of the vibe of the, uh, to the track. And it's so difficult now because I'm used to playing in a band and you can play off other instruments, mm -hmm. uh, other musicians. You're used, uh, songwriting process has changed a lot for me because I'm no longer like, you know, okay, let's try this again, but do this. Like yesterday I was recording and I was trying to write uh, two or three tracks, two or three parts at once basically. So I was switching back, before, back and forth between guitar and bass as I was trying to figure out the chord structure, and then what would the bass be doing here? And I can't just have the bass player play it. So um, yeah, but some of the some of the mistakes that we I, I guess we'll be talking about that in the second part of the question. So I'll, maybe I'll hold off on that. But <laughs> for for myself, um, as far as my own recording, like I try to do it as much original performances throughout the whole songs. And then when I'm double tracking, like I'll do uh, hard pan guitar parts there'll be two different parts so you have variation in the stereo field and it's not something that you go there's something wildly different happening but it, it just kind of keeps our our mind interested our ear interested in it just like those imperfections we talk about in analog synthesizers like well the oscillators are drifting against one one another but if you're doing two rhythm tracks whatever whatever the instrument and, and you have them playing the same basic part there's always going to be variations and you're going to have that kind of um what do you want to call it like that organic that's what's the word that's I'm looking massive, for that yeah the, it's just um a thickness isn't it it's just yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, that the whole thing about panning the same guitar part played twice it's just like it's so good <laughs> i love that sound. <laughs> and the same with same with backing vocals you know you can get a preset you know you can put your vocal in the middle and it'll stick a version left and a version right tune slightly up and tune slightly down forget it you know sing it twice yeah, yeah. um yeah. sing it four times if you can left and right mm. and and leave out the consonants leaves out the t and this on the end mm. and leave that to the one vocal in the middle and then balance it right and it just sounds heavenly you know yeah, yeah. absolutely great yeah we used to use I, that all the time <clears throat> i love it when you were talking you were talking about multi-tracks and listening you know and, and stripping and listening to that stuff Mm. Um, the classic albums uh, documentary series, which is um, I think it's now available on Amazon Prime Video. There's a lot of episodes on there now. If you, <coughs> if Amazon want to send me a free year subscription for that plug, um, the the one that always gets me is uh, th there's there's two. There's Stevie Wonder's songs in the key of life, and when you strip that back um, and you listen to some of those parts, you you think. That just doesn't sound right. It sounds a bit, and then you bring everything back in, and it's oh, yeah, it just it just works. And then the other one is Steely Dan's Asia, which you know is perfection personified, and there's not a bum note in there at all. And when they play the mixes, they didn't, or the you know the like the guitar solo on um, I forget which track it was now. Um, and they had a whole bunch of guys come in and do it, and then you know this one guy did it, and it just works. But you hear all this other stuff, and you uh, you just hear it's it's just not perfect enough for Steely Dan. Um, and they they were absolutely right to do it exactly yeah. the way they they did it. It was absolute perfection. Um, There's and no you, right way of doing it, is there? No, it's just. It's and just I think you, know, you and I, Don, we're both big fans of Scritti's Cupid and Psyche '85, and I've heard Dave Gamson tell stories <laughs> of how they just went over and over and over to get it absolutely yeah. spot on and there, there's no there's not a bum note or a bum anything there's no mistakes in there whatsoever no, because completely it, but it but but you can lose something doing that yeah you know if you do it right that's that that's really a good sign of a producer i guess and i'm talking old school style trevor horn style producer whose job it yeah. is to get the album out whatever that takes whether he doesn't yeah. show up till the last day or whether he plays everything on it that, that's what the producer used to do and 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 that still sounds great today actually trevor horn seems to have that ability to not produce the crap out of absolutely everything so it sounds mm. bland i'd argue that some of the def leopard stuff which is produced crazily actually does edge in the slightly bland stuff in in retrospect mm. although it's you know it's a personal choice you know and then the other end of the scale you've got the, the bands that just get out there and play whether you know, whoever they might be from the stones to you know, 
yeah. anyone um, that just have a loose, cool sounding feel to the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, I think people <coughs> are used to hearing perfection at the moment, and there, there's yeah. a mo there will be a move back, or there is a move back to real life stuff. You know, yeah, the, the the whole kind of auto tune effect I really love. Yeah, you know, I've got nothing against auto tune. I've got nothing against you, people using whatever tools they want to make a noise. And if people enjoy this, mm -hmm. great. But I think um, the 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 TV shows, singing shows, brought back real singers because people realised that not everyone could sing. But you're still getting these really perfect productions, really perfect mm. pop safety, which I think mm. needs to be kicked back the other way a little bit. You know, and it's time yeah, for new pop. And it's kind of funny, right, though, yeah. it, you know, and it's shocking. Just you know, you were talking about Def Leppard, and if you listen to something like that was like just produced crazily, like Hysteria, which is a great sounding album, but then when you compare it to some of the pop stuff that's out today, I, I, I mean, that's that stuff is really rigid. Mm -hmm. In comparison, mm -hmm. and even something that I would consider in the rock world is pretty pretty rigid and fine tuned, like Hysteria, it still has a lot more vibe to it than, yeah. than a lot of new stuff. And I hope I hope you're right because, uh, you know, having having some of the performance back, uh, um, just watching somebody was talking about like you know it used to be that we could we could you know hear live performances and you'd hear band members playing their instruments well and they're playing off one another and pretty much these days like if you watch a, a super bowl halftime show it's all choreographed dance stuff there's no musicianship to it anymore mm -hmm. even if the person performing is is an, a musician and a great performer so much of the time it's just a show and it has nothing to do with music it's so yeah like i said overproduced I mean, it, it's, don't get me wrong it's 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 not easy to be loose and play like that you know to, to record anything that that people love is generally quite hard work mm -hmm. you know so you have to work hard at making clean clinical great sounding pop music as well as recording the stones who happen to be making a good noise together and to get that whole thing together takes a mm -hmm. lot of skill on, on both ends you know i just want a little bit more dirt back again you know i want that that yeah. kind of attitude that came mm -hmm. back from punk originally or, or nirvana when they came to you know just a little bit further back and i think we're going to have to have a something coming out on record rather than live performances at the moment because obviously there's no live performances yeah. so, so yeah. let's yeah. go and make some some live yeah. streaming stuff it, one thing that always annoys sorry oh, go on. no, uh, go, 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 go. Just gonna say, like, it, it leaves you quite cold this perfect produced sound doesn't it mm. it's, it's like when i it's very rare that some I'll listen to something that's been you know released a, a, and every single bit of it is absolutely perfect. It's perfect. There's there's no noise in it. it it's all quantized perfectly. It's arranged perfectly, and you just kind of, it just kind of washes over you and like and then like some like something like I don't know uh, so, some like indie band <laughs> will do something that it's like there's. Uh, you, it's just you emotion in it, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you can hear them drop the guitar halfway through it. Or there's only <laughs> like three strings on the guitar. The, mm. the, it's a really poxy drum kit, and it, and you want to go out and buy it for some reason. It's yeah. like we really connect to this. Well, the, hu the human, sound. the human brain loves imperfection you know mm. it's it, because it's natural it, it, you know that whether you know, whether it's an offbeat this or a, you know a slightly out of tune that you know it, it it makes it more appealing and i was just looking down i've got a whole bunch of peter gabriel live albums that i've been going through and peter gabriel is um well known for recording the, the you know taking these recordings then overdubbing to mm. get it you know to his degree of perfection and i think it kind of spoils it a little yeah. bit because you know we we know that live performances aren't perfect that's what makes them live and that's what makes them great and so you know and he's not the only one i just singled him out because it just kind of sprung to my mind but you know there are a lot of artists that will you know they'll do a specific live recording and then take it back into the studio and oh yeah there's a bum note there let's get that out and put it in no leave it in that was there that yeah. was the moment yeah you know, don't destroy those mistakes they're what make you human, and mm. you know there are others. You know the, some some of the best live recordings are you know just straight from the desk and um, sound. Amazing. I've got the opposite story of that actually. This is this is probably my leading on to the second stage though. Mm. But we 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 me and uh, Ben and Andy Boilerhouse, a, a DJ 
uh, duo got the gig to remix a song for Kim Mazel. Oh, no yes. one can love you more than me, which wasn't a hit. It's the, probably the best record I've worked on that wasn't a hit in the whole history of everything I worked on. And um, we did this remix, a great tune. It's um, a Rick Wake production. Who you know, he's done Whitney Houston. He was the in-house producer for Sony. So mm. you name it, you know, this guy is just up there. So we're like, wow, this is great. You know, we'll do the remix. And we did this great remix, um, a lot of programming. We got some real percussion on there, but it came out, it sounded brilliantly. And we got, a week or so later, we got this message back saying, well, we think we're going to use this as a single. I was like, mm. wow, this is fantastic. Mm. This mix works. But um, we've got a couple of little tweaks to it. So, like, oh, brilliant, that's fine. I've still got all the discs and everything. You know, we can go back in. So they did this whole... I got this call, you know, did they... We'll set it all up. You've just got a little bit of work to do on it. it didn't tell me what it was. So I turned up at... I think it was Psalm. Everything was recalled and whatever in the big live room. I'm thinking, what's going on? And uh, they said, oh, we didn't tell you, you've got a piano solo to do. <laughs> so we didn't tell you because we thought you might be a bit nervous. So they're all there, right? <laughs> 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 I was like, well, I'm glad. I'm glad you didn't tell me. Anyway, look, I'll just, I've got a great piano sample sound here. So we'll set it like, so no, 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 no. There's a piano all mic'd up. <laughs> <laughs> they got the back, didn't they? Yeah. Okay, and and Kim's coming down soon, so you know it will be good. So so I'm like, oh, all right, fine. So I'm sitting at this piano, and I can play piano, but to be dropped in like that was wasn't mm. my you know my most comfortable <laughs> moment. So I said, all right, well, do, have you got any idea of what's going on? He said, no, no, no. You, you, there was piano that I programmed on the track anyway, something along those lines. And so I said, like, run the track a couple of times, just just go round it. I'll see what I can come up with. So I kind of worked out this thing. And I, that, that must have gone around, you know, 15, 20 times. I said, how's that sounding? And they said, um, brilliant, that's it, you can go. And they actually recorded the take that I'd done messing around, and it sounded fine, and that, oh, was, yeah. that was the end <laughs> of my go. session. And it was a mistake. And and it was, honestly, if I'd thought about it, if they had told me, I'd have, like, worked out this pristine little thing, been really uptight, I'd have been really nervous about the whole thing. Um, and actually, just playing, I think they might have either t taken a couple of, drop-ins whilst I was practicing the, the various takes and uh, funnily enough I hadn't heard this track for ages I listened to it before I came on it sounds great it's a really good <laughs> song. Um, it was a shame it wasn't a hit but yeah that was a complete mistake that ended up on tape and yeah. captured the vibe fitted well, you, in really well and you know why it wasn't a hit is because they used the crap tape they, they used the wrong <laughs> piano solo, didn't they yeah yeah that's why <laughs> that was Absolutely. like uh I forget the name of it. what whose song is it that uh uh, the, the, it was the bass was recorded the same way. He was screwing around in the studio, and so he's the like all song. over the. Oh gosh! Uh, yeah, yeah, probably. Of, um, I mean, there must be a few like that. I don't know which mm. which tune it is. But, uh, uh, I gotta think of the name of it. But uh, yeah, I mean, he was just. I mean, it's a, it's the busiest bass line. He's all over the place. Like he's just noodling. Like, like you know, you do. You're just sitting playing, and yeah, something's yeah. on. You're just whatever, and then end up like, oh no, that's the bass line. Or same thing, like I've heard uh, uh, Keith Emerson, the lucky man, so like he wasn't mm. happy with it. And everybody's like, no, don't change it. Fortunately, <laughs> yeah. they they told him, they didn't <laughs> let him change it because <laughs> I mean, that, there's, <laughs> there's a song uh, I worked with Errol Brown quite a lot. He was a band called Hot Chocolate. I think mm. they were massive in the States. I think, I can't remember if they broke over there or not. They were massive in the UK yeah. mm. um, in the 70s, like a disco band. Amazing, amazing singer. He wrote, um, him and Mickey Most wrote three or four number ones of colossal yeah. sellers over here and um i believe in miracles is one of these tunes and it's got this guitar riff that goes down dong 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 and he said they were in the studio and they couldn't work out the guitar riff and the guitarist just lying in the back like this and he goes dong 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 and him and mickey Mouse, that's it that's the one, that's the one. <laughs> don't be stupid you know and they spent the rest of the night arguing with the guitarist that this was the riff for the tune and they've yeah. absolutely got it right and yeah over his dead body finally he allowed it onto the tune and just became a massive absolutely <laughs> yeah. massive massive smash so. but this is the world we live in nowadays you know this chris pointed out you know we 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 do all our recording on a computer now there's very little that's done you know on, on tape and if you've got the ability to fix that note, to change that tuning, to omit that fart sound that happens, or whatever, <laughs> you know, it, it you can and you you generally will, you know, because you just it's just there. I mean, I, when I did my um, thing for for Songbird, I had to play the solo on the I was playing the solo on the Prophecy, 
and I'm not a keyboard player naturally, so I was just kind of you know improvising and I I'm a, I visualise where all the notes are and then I just make sure my fingers land on them and hopefully in the right sort of order. <laughs> and there were one or two moments where I I hit the wrong note. One of them worked and I left it. The other one didn't, and so I just came back in and and just drew you know on the piano roll and just moved it to to the right note. And when it's synced up with a video, only you know the the the, the eagle eyed will be able to tell that the note that's playing that that one little note isn't the note that I'm hitting because I've just shifted it up there. But you know, it was just a perfect example where one note was hit wrong, but it worked, and the other note was hit wrong and it didn't quite work. And so you know, one one stayed and one went. But you know, that, so, uh, yeah. that track that I was talking about, I I believe I just pulled up iTunes to look at track names. I believe it was the real me off of Quadrophenia. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, that would make sense. Yeah, it's quite yeah. bonkers, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so it's overthinking stuff. I think yes, that's the thing, isn't it's it? exactly Don't that. Overthink it, you know. It's exactly that. The, the more stuff I do, the less time I spend mixing it. I just make sure I got a really good source sound. You know, if you want a kick drum, just be happy with the kick drum with no effects on it. Don't try and fix it. You've got mm, your yeah, kick. You know, yeah. Less and less I add to it. That's I'm quite so. intrigued about like we mentioned that like the human brain like you know finds like imperfections more appealing and that. In music, but how, how would you go about making the this like less than perfect sound in an electronic environment? What kind of techniques would you employ to to make? Because everything is naturally, isn't it? it you, you've got to you, you've got to break it really to to get that imperfection. It's not going to happen naturally. I think it's you can use the time constraint. So, like they uh, was it fact ten minute. Uh, make us tune in 10 minutes type thing yeah, is the extreme yeah. version of that yeah. but I mean I certainly if I find if I'm working on a tune if I've got time available to, to do it, I'll spend it on it whereas if you say right this this is done today and then it's going over there in a box f for the week or whatever and I, and I have 20 tracks to do in in a month whatever yeah 10 tracks in 10 days um, you absolutely have to stick to that I think you'd probably find at the end of the 10 days you'd go that one's brilliant and that one's really rubbish so we'll drop that one yeah. and we'll concentrate on this one where you might have spent too long on the one that actually wasn't really that good in the first mm. place yeah i can't yeah. really think of any other ways of yeah yeah forcing you to comp because it's, it's a compromise in your head at the time yeah. but it's not really a compromise sonically yeah time constraints it is got to be like one of the biggest influences on that isn't it like to get it done to keep mm. pushing yeah mm. Well, of course, time in, in the other sense of, of gridding everything. Um, if you've got, if you're if you're not working with live drums and you're using drum machines or, or software drummers, I mean, at least you know things like uh, the tune track uh, stuff has a human eyes, where at least it'll loosen it up from it yeah. being so yeah. strict. Now, yeah. you, you could probably go in there and and your DAW and, and adjust the tempo because I mean, if you if you look at some classic or, you know, at least, you know, I, I tend to think like very 70s rock, you know, Led Zeppelin and stuff, you have like some really big swings in BPM in different parts of the song, mm -hmm. but we don't think about doing that in an electronic music production to give it a different feel. Like, oh, we're going to slow down here. Like, what? No. Mm -hmm. But that that would be, to me, like one of the things too, is like if you can get that, that master grid a little off the grid, mm -hmm. Doing that and then doing, uh, you know, as we talked about before, is like if you're willing to record takes and not just cut, do a lot of copying and pasting, then I think you're always going to end up with a more natural feel. And it might take mm. you, it'll take you a lot. That's one thing that will take you longer because you're not going to fix it later. You're just going to make sure that it's good on the, the front end. Yeah. Mm. And, and yeah. I, would, I would totally be for like uh, tracking and if you got a good solo, but you hit you hit a boom note in there like yeah just edit that thing out but keep mm. the feel of that live yeah. track if you mm. can do it what you could do as well is you could like finger drum like a drum pattern in but like loose with no click and, and then yeah. get your door to extract the tempo from that performance and then then build around that and then you have got like a note or something haven't you as yeah. opposed to it starting off yeah, uh, Martin uh, Stonehouse in the, the chat says, I tend to use quantized strength adjustments quite a lot just yeah, to loosen up idea. any straight performance, which is a fantastic tip. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you move things 50% closer to the real beat rather than all the way. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. 
I mean, I have to say that uh, quantize is always my friend, particularly when it's you know, keyboard parts. But drumming is fine because that's my that's my main instrument. But um, yeah, I'm always you know, quantize is, has long been my friend for a very long time, and maybe I should try something like that just to get that that less kind of machine like sound. So let's have a look through some of these because some of these I knew about, some of them I didn't know about, and uh, these these are kind of classic uh, mistakes that have remained in popular songs. So. Um, Roger Lyons, we, we spoke, spoke about this, the Hey Jude, uh, and it's there. I listened to it. I've never noticed. I knew something. I could. I remember. I I knew there was something there, but I didn't know it was Paul saying, "Oh fucking hell!" Um, and when he listened to it, it's just, oh, oh yeah, that's it. You know, you can't unhear it after that. Um, Liam Fretwell's uh, "Tune Me the Bells" is littered with out of tune instruments, which adds to the character. Uh, Oxygen has a few timing issues, but considered. <laughs> I would assume much of it was done without a click or percussion, yeah. Uh, Beatles A Day in the Life after the first orchestral. Yes, this one I knew about. Uh, the first orchestral break going into Macca's section, you hear the word one. Uh, and the only reason you kind of picked that out is when they did, uh, was it the anthology stuff, and they released um, like all the different takes of that, which is just, you know, it's a massive education right there. You can hear, you know, the, who they got to do the 16 or the, the count, the, the count the bars. I forget, it was one of the engineers that was just going, one. <laughs> two three and they left the first one in um paul mccartney's harmonies on if i fell uh where he, he yeah that's uh, one you can <laughs> hear um blue monday's my uh my thing there uh, the beginning of roxanne by um uh the, the police sitting on the keyboard in the recording booth and then sting's subsequent laughter on the intro i didn't realize that was an accident i just thought it was one of those things but then you know i feel love has ob obvious timing issues um uh, what was it? There's some others in here. Dave Gilmore sniffing before the, the opening solo. I don't know whether he had a runny nose or whether he was just cleaning up. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, any other famous ones that you can remember? That, uh... um, yeah, one, any... one of my, uh, you know, I think uh, the Beatles and Led Zeppelin are, are the go-tos on that because they did end up leaving so many interesting things in and with the Beatles anthologies, hearing them joking around between tracks or they mm. put stuff on the end, uh, that when it comes to listening to the album versions of those tracks sometimes without John and Paul's little banter or John making fun of Paul's song or whatever, I kind of miss that when I mm. <laughs> when I listen to the regular version. Mm -hmm. And then like with Led Zeppelin, some, some interesting recording, you know, oddities mistakes his you know the squeaky bass drum pedal of course yeah um you sh i think it's you shook me off of led zeppelin yeah. one there's a part that always bothered me like i didn't like and then i thought once i thought it through i realized what happened so robert plant's vocals sound a very certain way on that song and then he does a harmonica solo and then right at the end of it before the guitar solo you hear him sing something again but it sounds totally different and, and I was like, why that sounds so different? And I realized that it was a separate take with the with the uh, harmonica, the blues harp or whatever. You know, Mike threw a, probably Mike threw a little amplifier or something. And then he pulls off the harmonica and does his, his vocalization because he's just so in that moment that he's not thinking about the recording. He's thinking about the performance. And it sounds different and a little bit off from the rest of the track. And then the guitars come in. And I always thought that was kind of an odd little bit but then once i thought about how it was recorded I'm like oh that's that's kind of fun hmm. there's a verse in working class hero i think so the first first, fourth verse, which is a completely different mic and a completely different vocal take i think you can you yeah. can hear that yeah. there's a reddit forum and i'm trying to remember what it's called oh, right. which is which <laughs> is dedicated. specifically dedicated for oh, yeah. bad things that have happened in recording there's a very fine <laughs> line between mistake and uh, well, a, a, not quite a mistake if you see what I mean you know because <laughs> yeah. they add to the ambience yeah. of the whole thing you know squeaky yeah. bass drum pedals is that a mistake <laughs> kind of adds to the ambience yeah. probably <laughs> if you're an engineer it would be if you're a listener mm, I don't know yeah the squeaky bass drum thing it's like it made, made me think of back in my school days uh, don't don't grasp me up for this this is illegal <laughs> somebody give me a tape copy cassette copy of Japan's <gasps> tin drum <laughs> album but Home when they record killing music, I know, yeah. Is. When they recorded it, they had the levels too high, but I didn't know this. And I listened uh, to this yeah. album and I was like, wow, this is that I need to, I need to do 
stuff like this this is the best sounding thing i've ever heard and then when cds came out and everything i thought i'm gonna write this wrong i'm gonna buy this cd finally <laughs> <laughs> give japan my money yeah and i bought it on cd and i didn't like it i didn't <laughs> It, you it, get so used to it, don't you? It, it was this yeah. distorted version of it that I liked. <laughs> that mm. It was only <laughs> slightly distorted, but that's the one I preferred. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the properly mastered one wasn't as good. My, my early started. days... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Robbie. No, 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 Chris, go ahead. So some of my, like, once I had started playing music and I was like, I need to listen to some, some real music, not stuff that people, kids listen on the radio... Uh, and so my girlfriend's father had a bunch of, uh, you know, records. So I went and go, cause my good grief, my parents didn't have anything cool to listen to. <laughs> so, so I went and I, I dug through his and I found some stuff I didn't like, uh, you know, three dog night or stuff like that. But then I found some albums that ended up being some of my favorite, like Led Zeppelin too. But I had went and have, had purchased a bunch of album, you know, just, you know, LPs, and I, at the time, I was like 15, 16 years old. And I would listen to him on my dad's old um, uh, record player, you know, just in the living room, old speakers and stuff. And one of the albums that I remember had a, a profoundly different sound to it was Led Zeppelin's Present. Sorry, I'm talking about Led Zeppelin a lot, but they're one of my favorites. And on the record, it was just so full and fat and listening to all that old sound system. And, and I'm not somebody that like, oh, you got to like, you know, have the experience of flipping the LP over and all that. I'm not I'm not into that. I'm, I'm happy listening to stuff off my phone. But when I got the CD, I was so horrified. I was like, yes, finally <laughs> I have this. I don't have to go monkey with that stuff anymore. I think it was after I had moved out of my parents' house. And, you know, sitting down there to listen to that on CD, I was like, oh, man, what the heck? Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember when I was learning to play the drums and Adam and the Ants were like really, you know, big in my, my world. And Kings of the Wild Frontier came out. And, oh, that's uh, great, though. Yeah, I mean, it's just that, <laughs> that whole intro. And you, you, you've, the beginning of the song is, you know, him just singing that refrain, New Royal Family, World Nobility, blah, blah, blah. And then you get the the, the timp, timpani roll, yeah. and then it goes into you know this um, Tom uh, riff extravaganza, I yeah. say. But I don't, I don't. I can't be the only person. Sometimes when you hear something, you hear it like on the wrong beat. <laughs> And so in in my mind I'm going one two three four but actually it's it's two three four and it's I, I'm, I'm like hearing it off the beat and so I learnt it like that and so I learnt and so I always thought God they they made that bit that goes from that that Tom thing to the main song like really fucking awkward to to transition to <laughs> and all all the time it was me it was only when I saw them live that I understood it. And even to this day, and I'm 50 odd years old, I still sometimes catch myself listening to it at the wrong, on the wrong beat. And it catches me out every flipping time. But there, well, there was another one that did something similar like that. Um, oh, that's it. Cupid and Psyche, here's a classic one. Cupid and Psyche 85, this was a mistake. Um, not just uh, a performance, but the wrong flipping version of Perfect Way was released on the uh, CD version, I believe it was. So they did a version of Perfect Way, which is when you listen to the uh, the version that kind of the, the supposed to be there with, and it's hard to describe the differences, but you'll know you'll know it when you hear it. It's definitively weaker, but they put it out. And if you go and listen on Spotify, it's that version. Green is pissed off to hell that they put. They've there's this right. mis mistake that's been around for thirty odd years, where they put the wrong mix of the track up on the album and the the other mix i think it's kind of officially titled the us remix or something but it was the mix that they wanted on the album and if you get the cassette and the, the original vinyl it's that is that mix but if you got the cd it was this wrong mix and then that's what spotify and all the streaming mm. services have have taken on board as being the and so there's a whole legion of people that have heard this and think that's the definitive version and it isn't it's that's a, yeah so that's not just a, tra a, a, a an instrument that's a whole bloody track yeah, any others? I can't think of I don't know that anybody in the chat room has uh, come up with any um, 
things on there, but no, they're all talking about you know good stuff and bad, but not you know um, mistakes. Fascination by the Human League. Yes. That's yeah. always sounded horrendously out of tune to me. That is out of tune. Yeah. <laughs> and here's an, you've just reminded me Human League. I was trying to transcribe um, uh, Love Action because I wanted to. I want, and a, a friend of mine up in Blackburn somewhere did a brilliant MIDI version of it, sent it down to me. And you know the, the bit that goes bow, bow? Yeah, 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 the cat thing. Yeah, let's call it the cat thing. Yeah. Um, part way through, the the timing of that shifts, and, well, and then he goes back again, huh? and then oh. he goes back again, and he he listened to it and just just assumed you know using a computer that it was just you know there it was on the one or whatever, and then he forgot this little bit and when I listened to it it was just like Wah! you know big alarm bell so you could hear it a mile off, but again I don't know whether that was a mistake from you know the human league that it. it the, it shifted its timing and then shifted back again. I but, never noticed that. I've just been yeah. well working on that a few weeks ago and I didn't notice yeah. that. It's bit. it's absolutely br- yeah. It's a brilliant song. I love I love that album. Yeah. But there is that little bit and it just it, it kind of goes off for a, like a middle eight and then it comes back and it's it, the, the timing has shifted from like on the beat to off the beat or something or the other way around. I know, I know on cars, Gary Newman's cars, the, the actual tempo, the track speeds up every time the drummer does a drum fill. Like, yeah, that like happens by. with a lot of bands. Actually, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember I had to try and chop up it's a Duran Duran track. Quite a lot. Drum like. under you once, and it's all over. This does it sounds great until yeah. you actually look at it on a on a you know on some bars. Like, what the? You know. yeah. So yeah. here's the thing. I, I got this the other day. The, the TD3, the the Behringer TD3, which I think you guys can just see there. And I've been having loads of fun with it. And the first thing I did with it was to program uh, this bass line in. <laughs> <laughs> which is orange juice rip it up so i thought uh, to help me just get the you know get the right notes and the right tone you know because you know the filter and everything i'll call it up on youtube or whatever and i played it and um there was this uh live performance and zeke maniac is it zeke maniac the drummer mm. um who is absolutely brilliant drummer but they, they're doing this thing like on the tube or something and they all come in at all the wrong fucking time and the the drummers, you know, um, it starts off because they didn't use the 303 live. So Edwin Collins is playing that, you know, that guitar riff, but he's really going for it. So he's, he's quite nervously excited. And Zeke's trying to get him back into, you know, so the first like four, eight bars of that is Zeke trying to say, get the fuck into time, <laughs> you know, because and, and then once they're there, it's fine. But um, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, I love that song. <laughs> really good. Any others? Any other suggestions uh, that we can look out for? Because I'll, I'll, I love going through that and just listening for those things. Doesn't seem to be much in the chat room. There's lots of uh, talk about simple minds in there at the moment, and uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is not a bad thing, of course. Yeah, um, we must get Mick back on one day. Yeah, he'd, um, he'd be well up for that. Yeah, and hopefully better, with a better internet connection. So uh, that would be good. Anyway, um, so before we go, Ben, you were you wanted to have a or you just sort of uh, expanding your experience with Cubase 11, oh, you said. I, I've been, yeah. I, I don't know if I want to go into <laughs> this. is a good thing or a bad thing. Right? <laughs> yeah. I hope we are ending on a positive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I've been, uh, I put, I installed the demo of Cubase 11 and I was like, oh, this is like really good, this. And then I've got these, um, these things they're like you know like Mackie kind of it was bearing oh, yeah. ones, but like mm. Mackie control things and, and all of a sudden uh sending any kind of out from these you know like or you know rewind or something it caused that spinning beach ball thing oh, right. and then it just seemed to get progressively worse it was like you couldn't use these at all without the beach ball and then it was like the program was just going off and I, i've been like looking around online seeing if anybody having problems with it in cubase 11 and i couldn't find anything so I swapped to the steinberg cc121 you know the like the official hardware mm. controller for cubase and that's doing it as well and, and like you can't uh, so i thought it must be my like usb routing or something something must be going in some kind of loop and that so I put the CC121 uh, 
directly into the computer itself you know like there's no hub there's nothing and it was still doing it and, and i think that's like really a bit dodgy for, for for something that well yamaha have made for steinberg to not work with the steinberg software mm. uh, i thought it must have been something unique to me so i went back to cubase 10.5 or whatever it is the one before and uh, it, it works fine i did so uh, and one of the big what well, one of the big things with with cubase 11 is, is the inclusion of this spectral layers uh, one isn't it like now that you can to me anyway it seemed as though they were making out like now you can use this technology within cubase like the you know the the spectral layer editing it can be used within cubase so I thought, well, I'm going to lose that. And I was getting quite into that. I was spending quite a lot of time using it and stuff. I went back to Cubase and you can do it in that. <laughs> Cubase <laughs> 10.5, you can do it in that. So like th this update to 11, I, I don't, I'm not really sure what you are, <laughs> what you are what you're getting paying for, for your money. Yeah. I, I know that they include that spectral layers one in, in, in the package, but you know, you, you mm. can if, if you've got the other spectral layers you can you can still use that as a an extension in cubase and get all the benefits whatever so yeah yeah i've gone back to cubase 10 okay. or 10.5 because i'm not happy with 11 at all no that's a shame it's a yeah. shame and you'd expect more from them i suppose but yeah yeah and it's just like they want these incremental upgrades you know like 10 10.5 11 there'll be an 11.5 it's like you pay, you're paying like twice a year, really. For, this is exactly software. why I dumped it, and I've said this I'm, time and again. I've dumped, I'm, I'm I've at the point it. now where I'm thinking, well, probably me, me hardware stuff isn't going to, you know, get altered for quite a while. The computer's just been up, upgraded, like, totally, so that's not getting, up, <laughs> like, it, you know, updated for a while now. I might as well just stick with 10. It works. It mm. works for me, so, you know, what's the point of upgrading yeah. and, and throwing everything because I, I, I configured it all and then I lost it all and went back <laughs> uh, and so I had to spend like another day reconfiguring software and stuff and it, it just stick with what that's my my tip for the day is just stick with what works and, and, and <laughs> don't, don't buy QBase 11 <laughs> yeah um, just be reminded in the chat room you know, this today is five years since we lost David Bowie um, which is always you know just kind of kicking the nuts that one was very briefly i mean bowie had you know he was a, a big you know exponent of electronic music from the early days does anybody have you know, what's your favorite kind of bowie electronic track do you have one i've got so many favorite bowie tracks um but particularly with well well low the low the whole, the whole of low it, yeah it's just yeah. Like, side two of that is just what's our one exquisite yeah. like it's it's fantastic i think that's more yeah. down to brian eno than bowie but well yes yeah, yeah but it's still great yeah oh, a couple of my my favorites is him having uh, robert fripp come in and do mm -hmm. the guitar feedback thing for heroes yeah. Yeah. around on the different spots and uh you know one of my other you know oddly favorite moments uh is on uh ziggy stardust first of all like that intro like the guitars out of tune which kind of irks me a little mm. bit every time i hear it but uh who's this guitarist it was uh was it mick ronson, mick ronson. yeah mick ronson. yeah so but mick ronson the way he plays that and i've i've gone and listened to the bowie demos and bowie wrote the song he bowie plays it pretty straight but mick like it, it's behind a little bit when he does those little walk downs from like you know c b mm. you know on the bass notes of, Da -na 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 -na. But he's back, and every time I've heard uh, Bowie, you know, live or you know, just see performances on YouTube or anybody cover it, they never get that part right. And I thought, no. uh, so you know, for, there's for a Mick YouTube vid. Um, sorry to interrupt, that, that with him, and it's it's him talking about guitar pedals and sounds, or rather, the guy interviewing him wants to know about the sound, and it's only about five minutes long, and he says. Actually, when I'm playing exactly those chords, it's about the feel. You know, it's yeah. going to sound pretty much the same whether I plug it into, you know, with an amp with a bit of distortion, you know. Uh -huh. And he just strums these chords on a guitar which isn't plugged in, and you suddenly go, whoa, hang on, that actually. 
That's exactly yeah. it. And I'd never realized exactly what you're saying <laughs> up until um, that moment, which was so much to do with feel. Um, yeah. And he, when he, he, he gives this example, if I find the link, it would be in my history, I'll send it over to you. Because he's basically saying and demonstrating exactly what you've, what you've just said. Um, and it was quite shocking. It's quite shocking because a friend of mine was lucky enough to work with him. Um, and he said he's an amazing guitarist. But when you hear it with no sounds, you know, with no mic, mics up stuff going on, mm. and it is exactly the way it feels, which is which is the way it should be, I guess. Yeah, because yeah, they walk down that part, you know, and then they do it really straight. Yes. Something like that, but he has yes. that. Yes, exactly. Mm. That, but he just I does this that. really effortless thing while he's chatting to the guy. And he says, yeah, if you play it like this, and you know, it's like, whoa, where did yeah. that come from? Um, but yeah, absolutely. There's, oh, there's so many Bowie tracks. Like, they're just, mm -hmm. I mean, scary monsters. Yeah, I was going to say oh, scary yeah. monsters. Yeah, it's yeah. just scary epic. Monsters, yeah. um, I mean, funnily enough, uh, off that Black Tie White Noise album, Jump, they say, mm. is one of my favorites that came out yeah. about the same time as we were doing all the E17 stuff and I used to put that on in the studio as a <laughs> mix reference because right. obviously E17 should sound like Jump They Say by yeah, David yeah. Bowie so I was <laughs> like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the band are like what are you it's doing it's like, no 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 this is great this is this is what you need to sound like um yeah. and it was just epic yeah there's something about the the I don't know, just the sound of it, it just comes and it wakes you up yeah every time yeah. he does something like that yeah. However, I mean, Hunky Dory remains mm. personally kind of the main reason I even wanted to write songs. It's just such an astonishing album. And that's Rick Wakeman playing yep. piano on that. I mean, yep. he's an amazing guy. I um, didn't actually mind the Tim Machine album. I thought that was yeah. all right. I like Tim Machine. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, definitely. I've been having uh, conversations because I've, I've been collecting all the Bowie, um, you know, reissued, you know, anthology box set type things that they've been doing and they've missed... They didn't do one last year, um, but they're going to do one this year. And it's going to be the '90s stuff, and we're, we're still debating whether you know they'll include Tin Machine in that because it's not technically a David mm. Bowie release. It was a Tin Machine, but those albums still to this day cause many arguments amongst Bowie fans. It, you know, they're either brilliant or they're absolutely rubbish, and I think they're rather good. But I, I think they're good. Um, I, I, I'm not really that familiar with the second one, um, mm. but the first one was. Uh, it was like it was a bit jarring at first, but once you, the songs grew on you, and, and you know when you listen to it now, it's like the production is pretty good. It's quite yeah. raw and it's got loads of energy in it. Yeah, I dragged my wife when on her fiftieth birthday. She said, uh, or "I said, you know, what do you, what do you want to do? It's it's fifty. Uh, do you want to do something special?" And she said, "Let's go somewhere." So we like trying to decide. Now I, I just said. Out of the blue, I said, oh, "How about Berlin?" Because we both, you know, we both wanted to go there. She said, "Yeah, let's go to Berlin." And poor woman, I dragged her down to Hansa on this awful Sunday, was chucking it down with rain. We walked from our hotel to Hansa, and then just stood there. And you know, I was just like, listen, you know, in my head, I could hear, you know, heroes or whatever it was. And I found where the wall would have been, and I kind of stood, you know, where that famous lyric that uh, he wrote when Visconti was uh, kissing his, you know, his. Uh, girlfriend against the wall and, and it's just yeah it's a re really kind of moving sort of experience but uh, nothing like it was I mean I've seen pictures of of Hansa and you can see the Hansa building and then the opposite side of the road is just like wasteland and you know mm. barbed wire and big space. now it's just all you know it's um, blocks of flats and apartments and it's you know it's quite a nice little place but yeah what a place oh, and what a man one funny uh, little, little tidbit like that is you know the classic rock and roll song kansas city mm -hmm. you know gonna be standing on the corner in 12th street and vine if you go to kansas city there is no 12th street and vine <laughs> no but the fun the funny thing that they did though or at least not not recently anyway because that song you know is quite old but what they did is where 12th and vine would cross there's actually a park there and uh, i was checking it out on google earth and it and they put a big uh treble clef in the park <laughs> so i was like ah oh, that's great yeah that's yeah. good yes oh well there you go five five years since he left blimey that's gone quick it has yeah, yeah i remember it was, it was very much akin to john lennon i always remember wake, waking up in the morning because it was the morning here in the uk when the news started filtering through um and then you know my mum was bawling her eyes out i was bawling my eyes out 
and then when Bowie died, I was, you know, my wife had got up to get the kids ready for school. She comes up, she's bawling her eyes. I said, what's wrong? And said, Shit, what have I done? Have I, you know, did I leave something on the cooker or something? Um, and, you know, she said, no, Bowie's gone. And I said, like, oh, shit. And that was it. It was, it was like for a few days. It was very awful, very awful. But what a guy. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. on that happy note, um, I think it's about yes. time we wrap things up. <laughs> um, so uh, thanks ever so much for joining us. Um, and we should be back same time, same place next week. Dominic, thank you uh, for coming pleasure. back. Any time, yeah, enjoy. Thank it, so. you. Good I'm stuff. Not to be ill next time, but no, it's, it's no, no. A, glad you're feeling better. Such a good fun thing to do on a Sunday. So yeah, yeah anything, <laughs> anything fun in your world coming up? In, you know, during massive lockdown. Um, well, I've got. I'm working on these these VST these plugins. Oh yes. So uh, under the Mr. Wiggly kind of label. So that's that's really the next thing. So having having done the music uh, since. Um, sleep sounds app which just trundles along now quite happily mm-hmm. the stuff i've learned off the back of that i want to put together um just a, a bunch of effectively quite cheap cost effective really good quality simple plugins so you know you want to delay this is a really Amazing. good delay with some great settings you know, this kind of stuff I, I tend to find when i'm mixing stuff i put on the same kind of things and you know there'll always be some kind of filter on the top there'll always be some eq there'll be a delay there'll be a reverb you know um and they tend to be the same settings quite a lot of the time as well so i'm trying to put together my channel strip in in Mm. uh, in 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 cheap very simple to use plugins you know so Mm. you don't have to worry about milliseconds with delays or whatever you're just going to get it set right yeah yeah. Um, so that's the idea which is it's very early days so um but it'll well, let's know when they're available. We'll give them a, yeah, give them a shout out. Well, I'd like you to test them first, to be honest, as oh, well. Because yeah, obviously, well. We, need a, we need a decent team of testers. So so that's the plan. So Should you've got three hands up here. <laughs> Thank you. And two thumbs. Excellent. Yeah, two thumbs. <laughs> yeah, quite. Chris, how about you? You got anything interesting coming up this week? Uh, same old, same old for me. Yeah, nothing, yeah, nothing changes. Exciting. No. But that's okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this in this world. <laughs> if anything stays the same for a few weeks, it's good. Ben, how about you? More work on the album? Yeah, yeah. I'm just, lo- I'm just loving being in here at the minute. I've, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm forcing myself to come out of here to get some sleep. It's just, uh, I'm just enjoying <laughs> it that much. Uh, I'm, so. I'm, trying to do, I'm doing the, I'm, I do that. I, I sit in here till God knows what hour, and then go to bed and wonder why I feel shit in the morning. And it's because <laughs> I was in here till two, three o'clock noodling with something. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I've not yeah. been bed earlier than like five o'clock or something. Bloody yeah, hell! Yeah, it's like I'm You're really mad. Into it at the minute. No, I'm 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 really trying now. He says drinking a glass of wine. I'm trying now. <laughs> this is it. Gonna do the healthy thing. Bed at the right time and go for. I went for a two and a half mile walk today, and I'm ordering an indoor trainer for my cycle so that I can just cycle indoors when I want to, and then pop it off and go cycle. Because I'm a fair weather cyclist. I don't like cycling in the cold or the wet. So I'm going to get one of those into indoor trainer things, but uh, yeah. um, I've got new toys. So I've got um, I'm going to be learning the the TD three a bit more. Um, but I I got a cake this week, and it's not your typical cake. I've never seen these before. And then one popped up. It's called a session cake oh. by Yamaha, and it's this wonderful little kind of um, I suppose a headphone amplifier is one thing. But you've got a, a stereo input here. Uh, TRS input you've got a mic input you've also got an auxiliary input for um, and it's a two way so it goes in and out uh, for, for iPhone and then um, just a little you know you've got your pan control input phones levels and then if you've got lots of people you can daisy chain them with your friends up to a maximum of like four or something so you can have like a jam session it was 20 quid uh, that's you know, it was it's second hand it's all battery operated but I want to make videos with just I don't want to have I normally have all this stuff going on where I just want the phone, my microphone and the instrument. And this will all go in here and it will all output to to the you know the, the video recorder on my iPhone and just keep it really nice and simple. So hopefully uh, more right. yeah. more little videos I, using that. I'm thinking um, some some fun family time for the Percelli family. Yeah, this will get one of those and we'll see. <laughs> Gather around. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a new edition coming in on Tuesday. Hey? Um, oh, but a new old edition. Uh, it's black. And it has uh, green and red lettering on, and it hails from 1986, 87. Oh, um, it so, sounds like an SY something. No, 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 no. It's, oh. a, it's a TX, TX 
TX802. I managed to find one at ah. a really good price. Ah, so I finally, um, I've got tons of TX802 patches that you know, will only work on the TX802. So I can't wait to Have go you? through. Yeah. Oh, I, I you bought, can I share those. Well, I can't because they're all copyrighted. But, um, oh. They're all these these ones that I picked up from the uh, oh, proper ones. the last Vimeo oh. sale. The sound oh. source and, and these. Um, Dom will recognise the uh, the price label on there. Yeah. Ar yeah. Rod Argent's down on yeah, Denmark totally. Street. And as you can see, they, they were all still sealed. Wow. And I got those for about 20, 30 quid. A That's whole where I got of... my MKS 70 from, yeah. back in the day. Uh, I went down there a year or so ago because they've been redeveloping the whole area, haven't they? Because across the mm. rail and they've destroyed half of it. It's horrible. Yeah, it's, it's a real it's shame. Down there. there you go. So, yeah, I'm going to be playing with my, my new old fm synth yay mm. um right great wonderful um we will see you same time same place next week dominic thank you ever so much again for coming Pleasure on again. and um, we'll get you on this again soon Lovely. um ben chris all take care and uh i just need to keep waffling because as ever i've just been talking and not been paying attention <laughs> to what i need to do here um so yeah have a great week and uh stay safe stay healthy see you all soon bye bye